State Judge County Circuit Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Smith presiding. Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and go on the record. We're here on case 21 CF 825, State of Florida versus Aiden Fucci. Who do I have appearing on behalf of the State of Florida? Jennifer and on behalf of the defendant? Craig Haddock. And also Mr. Fucci is also present. You can all be seated, thank you. All right, we are here to begin our sentencing hearing. Uh, as we had previously discussed, we will begin the uh, testimony today. Uh, continue it into tomorrow. We would then recess until Friday where the court would announce sentence on Friday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, first, let's address two matters. We did uh, have both sides received a copy of the uh, pre-sentence investigation as well as the uh, adult sentencing summary form from the Department of Juvenile Justice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Are there any objections or exceptions to the, let's start with the pre-sentence investigation from the state? From the defense. Your Honor, I mean, we were going to address any objections on Wednesday morning. Uh, I understand the court's asking now if we could just revisit that this afternoon. Then. Okay, have you had a chance to review this? Yes, Your Honor, but it was there were several other things that we were going to object to it, and specifically, but we could address it this afternoon then, if the court wants to address it today. Well, I just want, before we get started, I just want to know if there's anything about this document that's objectionable, but I guess we can address it this afternoon if you need some time to, to further think about it. How about the Department of Juvenile Justice report? No objection. Same issue. All right. <clears throat> okay, any other matters we need to address uh, this morning before we get started from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything else from the defense before we get started? Before we recess today. Before we recess for lunch, yes. Before we recess for lunch? Yes. So anything we need to address right now? No. All right. Okay, uh, do we have witnesses that are ready? Yes, Your Honor. All right, State, you may call your first witness. State calls Deputy Robert Maloney. All right, Robert Maloney. <clears throat> Sir, if you'll pause right here in front of the clerk and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes, sir. All right, sir. If you'll come on up here and have a seat in the witness stand. Thank you. Counsel, your witness. Thank you. Good morning, Deputy. If you would, please introduce yourself to the court. Good morning. I'm Detective Maloney, St. John's County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been uh, employed with the St. John's County Sheriff's Office? Almost two and a half years. And what was your prior law enforcement experience? I'm a retired sergeant from the NYPD, and I also worked in the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office as an investigator. How many total years of law enforcement do you have? 20. Okay. What were you doing with the agency back in May of 2021? What was your role? I was on patrol in the Northwest sector. Did that um, particular area include the Durban Crossing neighborhood? Yes, ma'am. I want to direct your attention to May 9th, 2021. Were you working that particular day? Yes, ma'am. And what day of the week was that? It was uh, Mother's Day on Sunday. Okay. Did you get dispatched to a call reference a missing juvenile that morning? Yes, ma'am. And do you remember what time? May I refer to my notes, Your Honor? You may. Approximately uh, 10 or 6 in the morning. And where did you respond? 231 Cloister Bean Drive. Who was the complainant or person that called 911 that you met with? Uh, Tristan's mother, uh, I believe her name was Stacy. Okay. What did you learn after speaking with Stacy Bailey? What, what did you need to do? Uh, when they woke up in the morning, Tristan wasn't in her room. Uh, she stated she believed she left sometime after midnight. Uh, they haven't seen her, weren't able to get in contact by phone, and none of her friends have heard from her. Okay. And so what did you appear to do upon hearing that information? Well, I checked inside the residence um, with any type of missing or runaway. You always do that, bedrooms, closets, 
checked the perimeter of the residence and there was, she was nowhere to be found. So uh, we learned some different names of individuals, uh, friends or whatnot that she could be hanging out with. So I started following up on those leads. Okay. Did you or the family members attempt to contact her by phone? Yes, ma'am. And did you learn anything? What was happening when you would reach out by phone? It was going directly to voicemail. It wasn't even ringing. Okay. And where was the first residence you visited to check on her whereabouts? May I refer to my notes, Your Honor? Thank you. First residence I arrived at was uh, 145 Telford Drive. And who was supposedly at that residence you wanted to check with? His name is Dafius Absher, but his nickname is Trey. Okay. And do you recall what time you arrived at the Absher home? 11.07 a.m. Okay. That first time in stopping at the Absher home, did you gain any useful information? No. Okay. What did you do after that initial stop, and then where did you go from there? Just followed up on some other leads. Okay. Did you... Um, eventually go back to 145 Telfer and speak with Trey again? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and did you learn anything there that um, caused you to continue on a lead? Yes, ma'am. And what did you learn there? I learned that uh, Tristan was at that residence in the very early morning hours with Aiden Fucci, and that they eventually left there approximately one in the morning. And what did you do in response to learning that information? Um, from there, I went to. Let me see. Oh, pardon me. I went to uh, Aiden Fucci's residence. And what address was that? Seven twenty four Castle Dale Court. And do you know approximately what time you arrived at Aiden Fucci's residence? Eleven forty, a.m. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Do you have any objections? No. Okay. Your Honor, actually, without objection, state the state C and D. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. That would be received as uh, State's Exhibits uh, 1 and 2. And permission to publish as you necessary, may. Your Honor? You may. All right, Deputy Maloney, and um, can you just describe to the court, there's some things marked on here. Do you see the Absher home? and ultimately the Fuji home marked on that map. May I stand, Your Honor? I can't yeah, see you. Can Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Oh. Thank you, sir. Okay. On the bottom of the screen, there's a uh, yellow pin that marks the Absher residence. There's one also marking the Bailey residence, and there's one marking the uh, Fuji residence. Okay. So, do you recall approximately the distance between the Absher home and the Fuji home in that neighborhood? Maybe a mile, maybe a mile and a half. Okay. When you go to the Fuji residence the first time at approximately 11.40 a.m., what did you see when you arrived and who did you interact with? The garage door was open. As I approached the garage door, Aiden was standing directly in front of me. He was in the garage with his mother and I believe it was his stepfather. Did you uh, speak with them, uh, tell them why you were there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and what did you tell them and what information did you receive that time from Mr. Fuji? Well, I explained to him that um, you know, we were investigating where Tristan was, she hasn't, you know, wasn't home. Uh, I told him that I found out that he was at uh, Tra or Dafia Sapsha Trey's residence. Uh, I asked him, where did you guys go, what happened? He stated they left about 1 a.m. from Dafia's residence stated that Tristan turned onto Cloister Bain as they passed it walking on North Durban Parkway. And then he said he went right home. And Cloister Bain would have been the street where her residence was, correct? Yeah, uh, yes, ma'am, just south of North Durban Amenity Center. Okay. And did he indicate what time he got home that night, or did you ask that question? Uh, approximately 3.30 a.m. And when he told you that he didn't get home till 3 or 3.30, did you ask any more questions about that? Yes, ma'am. I told him his timeline doesn't match up, so it wouldn't take you roughly two hours to get home from that distance. He then stated, oh, uh, this isn't verbatim, I don't remember verbatim, Your Honor, stated that he walked by himself alone for a while. Okay. After that initial encounter in the garage with Aiden and his um, mother and stepfather, what did you do? I went and followed up on a, another lead, ma'am. And did you eventually come back to that Fuji residence? Yes. And do you know the timing of the second time you were at that residence? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
12.20 in the afternoon. Okay. What did you do this time? Well, this time I knocked on the front door of the residence. I believe the garage door was closed. I asked to, if I could speak to Aiden again, because he was the last one that we know that was with her. So we ended up sitting on the front porch of the residence and just talking. I thought maybe you know, he texted her and she contacted him. Maybe he thought of something else that could help find out where she was. And when you say we, who was on the front porch at that time? Myself, Aiden Fucci, his stepfather, and I think his uncle or some other uh, relative was out there. Okay. And did his mom come out as well at certain points? Possibly. I don't remember, ma'am. Okay. When you talked to him on the porch, what information did you learn, if anything, new or different at that time? Nothing different. Okay. And as you're talking to him, do you ask him to do something for you? Yes, ma'am. And what did you ask? I asked if he'd be willing to take a ride in my patrol car with me to drive along the path that he stated he walked with uh, Tristan. This way I could look for traffic cameras, cameras on houses, anything that would help possibly, you know, we can view a camera and say, oh, this car picked her up or whatnot. Okay. And did he agree to do that? Yes, ma'am. And did his stepfather or a parent know that that was happening and agree with that? Yes, ma'am. I asked his stepfather if that would be okay. He said yes, and he also stated, can I follow in my golf cart? I said, that's no problem at all. Okay. And did the stepfather, in fact, do that? Yes. And so now you have Aiden Fucci in your car, and you're taking him on this path. Um, I'm going to show a different map. Let me see for the record. Which one is it? It's two. Okay. It's two. And just use it as you as you need to as we explain this. Yes, ma'am. Um, tell the court what happened when you took him in your car and the conversation that developed in the car. Thank you. We started at Daphia Savage's residence because that's where he walked off with her. As we were driving along the path, we turned on to North Durban, and as we were approaching Cloister Bain, you know, we were just talking. I was, you know, I was trying to gather evidence of, hey, she had a friend's house and whatnot. I asked him, okay, well, what point did she break off with you? Was it before Cloister Bain, at Cloister Bain? He kept changing the story. And it kept getting further along after Cloister Bain, where he said, well, we just kept walking and hanging out. Okay. And um, this road that sort of runs through the middle of this map, that's on uh, North Durban Parkway? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You can see the amenity center, and the Leaf Hall is marked. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. What happens as you're driving him? Um, up North Durban Parkway towards Leith Hall. What does he tell you? Um, he tells me that they had a fight. Okay. And can you explain to the court exactly what he said and, and what you had him do? Yes, ma'am. Um, my apologies to the court. He stated that she, she grabbed him, she grabbed his penis, and that he didn't like it. He didn't want to cheat on his girlfriend. So he got mad and he pushed her and she fell on the ground and hit her head. And where did he describe that that occurred at? Uh, Lee, Leith Hall Drive. Okay. And what did you do when he told you that? Oh, well, I asked him if he could show me. He said yes. So we tur I turned my vehicle around. I did a three-point turn. I parked on the facing southbound on North Durban on the west side on the sidewalk, right opposite Leith, uh, Leith Hall Drive. We got out of my vehicle, walked over to where the sidewalk is. The sidewalk had some bushes, and I asked him to demonstrate what happened. And did he do that? Yes, ma'am. And was his stepfather in the vicinity um, and other members of his family, I believe, arrived about that time? Yes. Okay. And what does he say he did after he pushed her down? He said he walked off uh, northbound on North Durban. Okay. Towards his, which would have been toward his residence, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. And so what happened next? Where did you take him? Uh, next, I... Um, Brought him back over to my patrol vehicle. At this time, I took all his belongings away and I placed him uncuffed into the rear of my patrol vehicle because now I felt he's, it's in custody, he's not allowed to leave. Okay. And did you kind of advise your supervisors of what he had said and the change in that story at that point? Yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. And so where did you go with him at that point? What happens? I brought him to the parking lot of the North Durban Amenities Center. That's where a lot of the sheriff's office was staging in regards to trying to find her. Okay. And do you sit with him in your car for a period of time? Yes. Okay. Do you remember approximately how long you stayed there with him oh, that I day? Was, I was with him 
from, well, when I picked them up originally, but at the amenities center, I arrived at 2.12 in the uh, afternoon. I don't remember the exact time custody of him was transferred over to someone else to bring him down to CID. That was in the evening. In the evening, okay. And did anything um, occur with him in the vehicle with you? Yes, at one point, um, I'm typing my notes, my report, and I felt the back of the seat get kicked. And I turned around to see what was going on. Aiden was crying. And he said, can I refer to my notes again, Your Honor? Thank you, sir. <clears throat> and he stated, I'm going to get arrested, pardon my cursing, I'm going to get arrested for bullshit. I didn't ask him any questions. I just stated, if you didn't do anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. And so you stated at some point later that evening he was transported to the sheriff's office here, Criminal Investigations Bureau? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that was by another deputy? Yes, ma'am. Okay. During your interactions with Aiden Fucci that day, did he have any problems understanding your questions and communicating with you? No. Okay, did you have any concerns he was under the influence and that you shouldn't be asking him any questions? No. Did you have any more involvement um, after you turned over custody to him and went, went home that day? No. All right. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, cross-examination. Leave this or take it? Um, you can leave it. I'll just stay right here. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, just briefly, you testified initially that when you first went to uh, Dofus Absher's house, you didn't um, get any useful information? Correct. And is that because you learned later that Mr. Absher was not being forthright? Correct. When you went back and you met with Aiden in the garage, did he appear nervous and fidgety to you? Aiden? Yes. The, the second time you went. Oh, not the second? Yes. The sir. second time? The second time wasn't in the garage. The second time was on his front porch. The first time contact with Aiden was in his garage. At that point? At that point, no. Okay. Would you say he was nervous and fidgety uh, on the front porch and answering your questions? No. Not at all? No. Um, sorry, I'm, I guess I have to ask you to move that, sorry. So I was, I was not on this case when you did a deposition, but do you remember doing a deposition in the case? Yes, sir. Okay. And at that deposition, uh, Mr. Mosley from our office was asking questions. Okay. Okay. Um, and of course, you remember in the deposition, you swear to tell the truth and yes, answer sir. all the questions appropriately. So I'm going to ask you to review a deposition for the state. I'm just looking at page eight. This is line 15. Do you have your deposition in front of you? Yes, sir. Oh, what great. page? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, page eight. And then line 15 is what I'm looking at. And basically, if you could just review 15 through uh, 22. Uh, question, was this initial contact that you're making with Aiden, did you record this? No, sir. What was his demeanor like, nervous? What made you seem nervous to you? He kept fidgeting, kept looking around, kept putting his hands in, in and out of his pockets. Thank you. Yeah, I was just asking if, that, that was my question, did he appear nervous or fidgety to you? Well, during the deposition, it was a lot sooner after the encounter than it is today. Oh, are you saying your memory is a little different? Just for the nervousness. Fair enough, okay. Those are my questions, Judge, thank you. All right, thank you. Anything else from the state? No, Your Honor. I made this witness be excused. Yes. All right, sir, thank you very much. You're free to go. Thanks, sir. Thank you, everybody. State, you may call your next witness.
your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. All right, you can come on up here and have a seat in the witness stand. Thank you, Aaron. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please state your name for the record? My name is Marilyn Butts, M-A-R-I-L-Y-N-B-U-T-T-S. Thank you, ma'am. How are you employed, ma'am? I'm a crime scene technician for the St. John's County Sheriff's Office Forensics Unit. And how long have you been employed in that capacity with St. John's? Seven years. And um, do you have any prior experience in that field? I do. I was a crime scene technician for Louisville Metro Police Department in Louisville, Kentucky for nine years and employed with the PD um, since 2002 prior to that. Were you working with the St. John's County Sheriff's Office as a crime scene technician in May of 2021? I was. And on specifically on May the 9th of that year, did you become involved in an investigation um, in what started out to be the disappearance of a girl by the name of Tristan Bailey, but was later learned to be a homicide? Yes. Um, at what point um, in that investigation did you become involved? Um, approximately 4.58 uh, p.m. on May 9th, I was notified by my supervisor, Jennifer Ferraro, that I needed to respond to 750 North Durban Parkway. At that particular point in time, did you sort of have an idea of what your role might be right then? I had a general idea. Um, I became more aware once I arrived on scene. And what happened when you arrived on scene? Upon arriving on scene, my captain, Ryan Smith, uh, called me on the telephone and immediately requested me to respond to 601 Saddlestone Way, Saddlestone Drive, excuse me. Okay. And um, did, now you said, at what time was that? 609, did you say? Uh, <coughs> it was 4.58 hours and it was uh, 609. Uh, PM when I arrived on scene at the amenity center. Okay, and that's when you spoke with Captain Smith, and he told you, asked you to re respond to Saddlestone. Correct. Right. Did you um, receive? Did you actually respond as requested? I did. My uh, myself and Supervisor Ferraro, we were riding together, and we both responded there. And what was located at 601 Saddlestone Road? Uh, upon arrival about 6.15 p.m., Captain Smith uh, advised that a deceased female had been located in a wooded area southeast of 601 Saddlestone Drive. Okay. And um, this particular area, was this a residential area, commercial area? What? what it was, was a residential area, and it was the end of a cul-de-sac. Okay. So when you get there, um, and he and Captain Smith gave you sort of that information, what did you do? Um, I was briefed on the scene. Um, I had been advised that uh, Tristan had been found uh, in a wooded area past there, and I was shown an air, uh, the path in which I believe D Deputy Nybauer had taken to get to where she was. Um, I documented the scene with photography, um, moved into the pathway and over two fences, um, and down the the side of the retention pond to get to where she was located. Okay, and you indicated that throughout this process, when you get on scene, you're kind of told basically what was found, where she was located. From that point forward, you're documenting this particular area and you continue that um, through processing the scene where Tristan Correct. Bailey was found. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may.
I did. And what do you recognize them to be? Those are my scene photos. Are they fair and accurate photographs as the scene appeared to you on May the 9th of 2021? They are. And uh, this time, Your Honor, offer um, State's Exhibit A into evidence. Any objection? No objection. That would be received as uh, State's Exhibit Z. It's going to be three as a composite. All right. And published states three. Okay. Ms. Butts, I'm uh, showing you states 3A here. Can you, it's like some kind of placard here. Can you kind of just describe what we see in this photograph here? And what the purpose it's my of this photo is? placard for the beginning of my photographs with the date, the case number, my name and ID number, and the location in which I photographed. All right. Moving to states 3B, um, obviously this is an aerial, correct? Correct. And can you kind of give an idea of kind of, we, we talked about um, the location that you responded to, 601 Saddle, um, Saddlestone. Where is that located on this aerial map? It is the far right end of the cul-de-sac, the house on the south end. Okay. And there's a notation there um, with a kind of a blue mark. Can you describe what that is? That's the approximate location uh, where Tristan was found. Moving here to States 3C, what is this in this photograph? This is the east side of the cul-de-sac and the, uh, the beginning of my photographs of where I made entry into the pathway to go across the fences. Okay. I'm gonna go back to 3, 3B. And can you kind of describe, using this aerial map, um, and there's a screen right beside you that um, may be helpful to do this. Can you kind of describe what did you where did you go when you got there? And, um, and after uh, Captain Smith basically told you what was found. Okay, I parked at the end of the cul-de-sac. Um, I briefed with the uh, deputies and command on scene. Um, I then uh, met with Detective Ramos, uh, who had a drone that um, he deployed uh, over the area. And once he saw a clearing and it appeared to be a body there, he showed me a visual so I knew where I was, approximately where I was going. Okay. Can you take the area map and show sort of where you went? Can I have the witness stand down here? Sure. Sure. I can see it. So I parked it right in this area here. The drone uh, operator went down this way, down south of the, on this grassy area, and he deployed in this general area. There was a clearing in the trees where he was able to show me on his screen a visual of where it appeared that a body was located. After that, I entered this area right here. There's two fences. I climbed over those and walked down this side of the retention pond to this location where there was another fence, and that's where I met Deputy Nybauer, and he indicated where she was uh, on the south side of that fence. All right, moving here to say 3D. Uh, just kind of walk us through these and tell us what we're looking at in these photos. I placed two flags at the entry of the path uh, for photography purposes to show where I made entry into the scene. Okay. And then 3E here is just more of that same path? Correct. Right. And 3F is just closer to that fence, is that right? Yes. Right. And then 3G kind of shows the proximity of the retention pond? Yes. 3H is the retention pond, is that right? Yes. And then 3I, is this the path that you walked down toward um, Deputy Niegebauer? That is correct. Right. And 3J? Uh, he is standing just north of the fence line where we made entry into the area where she was found. Right. 
And then 3K, what are we looking at here? That's the fence that uh, we went, I went through to get to the actual scene. Right. 3L? Just another view of the same. Okay. And at this point, were you able to see the body of Tristan Bailey? Barely. Okay. 3M? That's coming uh, through the fence and a couple, a little, maybe 15 feet south of the fence and looking back to the west where there was a clearing where she was located. And is this exactly how she was found? Yes. Right, and then going here to 3N. Just another view. Right. And when you, got, when, you were, when you got to this location, were you able to see um, injuries that she may have suffered? I did. Then 3O, what do we see in this photograph? Just a, a closer up view of her Are body. Are you able to see some of the injuries that you yes. observed? And where were those located? Uh, she had injuries um, on her arms uh, and on her, on her head and on her back. 3P? Just another view of her arms. 3Q? Uh, this is a, a, like a west-east view of where she was positioned. Um, does this photograph also show any items that you were able to locate in the vicinity of her body? Yes, I have photo marker um, number two, uh, which is the yellow placard in the photograph that has a $20 bill, a vape pen, a ring, and a cell phone. Right. And is that what we see here in and states 3R. Yes. And 3S. That's all the items separated out. The $20 bill, the cell phone, the ring, and the vape pen? Correct. Um, Ms. Butts, how long did it approximately did it take you to process the scene there? Uh, I was on scene um, at approximately 6.15 p.m. and at approximately 8.26 p.m., the medical examiner investigators arrived on scene to do their investigation. Um, and then St. Johns County Fire Rescue assisted us with the transport to uh, St. Johns Family Funeral Home that was on standby at the back parking lot of the nursery that was the actually address where we were. And they assisted in removing Tristan's yes. body from the scene. And approximately what time was it that you sort of finished up there at the scene? Uh, I finished up at 10.52 p.m. Right. And what were you asked to do next? Um, I was asked to respond to 724 Castledale Court a and, few minutes after midnight. Okay. So not long after you finished at the Correct. scene? Correct. Okay. Um, what was your... Un your understanding of who lived at 724 Castle Dale Court? I was uh, told that that was Aiden Fucci's residence. And did you respond as requested? I did. And approximately what time was it when you arrived there on scene at, at that house? Uh, it was a little after midnight. Okay. Can you kind of describe the, the, the residence as, as it first appeared to you when you got there? Uh, it was a two-story dwelling with a three-car garage facing southeast. Uh, the downstairs consisted of a front entry dining room area. There was an empty room inside the door, a kitchen, a pantry, laundry room, master suite, and another bedroom and bathroom okay. downstairs. When you arrived on scene, was the scene secured? It was. And how so? Uh, there was crime scene tape around the scene and there was a deputy on scene for security. What was your understanding of what your role was going to be as it related to this particular house? Uh, I was told that we were executing a search warrant. All right. And um, had a, a search warrant already been um, received or did you have to wait for one to arrive? Um, I believe we had to wait a little bit, but uh, we didn't make entry until we were told it was ready. Okay. Um, so once the search warrant got there, what did you do? Um, at that point, I photographed the scene and documented the scene, and then a search was performed. All right. And did you take photographs throughout the search of 724 Castle Dale Court? I did. You may. Oh, shit.
All right. Uh, what was previously received, uh, previously marked as State's Exhibit D, was it D or B? B will be received into evidence as uh, Composite Exhibit State's Exhibit 4 uh, over objection. May I publish states for your honor? You may. All right. So I'm going to go to states 4A. Uh, again, we see another placard here. Can you just describe what this is? Uh, that's my photo placard for the search warrant uh, for May 10th, 2021, with the case number, my name, and ID number, and the location, the address of the search warrant. All right. And moving here to 4B, this is just a front photograph of the home at 724 Castledale? Yes. Right. Now, uh, what I want to ask you here is you didn't kind of gave a brief description of what some of the interior of the house looked like, and we're going to see some photographs here. Was there um, a particular room in this particular house where evidence was found? And if so, where was that bedroom located? Yes, the upstairs portion of the residence um, contained a bonus room, four bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a common area that was at the top of the steps. And we were, um, we were concentrated most of the part in the northwest bedroom upstairs. And that, and that would have been the bedroom of Aiden Fuji? Yes. Okay. All right, so going here to states 4C, um, what area of the home is this? That's the front entry. You can see stairs here uh, leading up to the second floor, is that correct? Correct. Right. And then states 4D, What's, what area of the home is this? That's the upstairs like common area, uh, and the door with the stickers on it is the northwest bedroom. Right. Aiden Fuji's bedroom? Yes. All right. And then 4E is just a close-up of that same door, correct? Correct. Right. And go to 4F, what do we see here? It's a photograph with the door open. And the next series of photographs, kind of what are you doing in the in those? I'm doing overall photographs of the bedroom. Right, here, 4G. The desk area. 4H. Just a, 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 from the door to the corner showing the bed. 4I. And then straight down the, the other wall. So you basically just kind of pan the room, is yes. that correct? And then 4J, what do we see here? That's a, just an overall from the opposite corner showing the closet. And was that closet searched? Yes. All right. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Um, were you doing this by yourself? Do you have, have help with No, you? I had uh, Sergeant David Garns and Detectives uh, James Gimenaro, uh, Jesse Howell, John Newman, and Kermit Kidder. And sort of what was everybody's roles in the search of the home? I've documented the house with photography, and as they were finding items uh, of relevance, they would call my name, and I would come and do a, an overall mid-range and close-up uh, of the item located. And some of these detectives that you mentioned that were assisting you, uh, were they uh, also assisting you in helping search this particular bedroom that belonged to Aiden Fucci? Yes. All right. And was your attention brought to some items that were located inside the closet? It was. All right. And in here in 4K, what do we what do we see here once the closet is open? Uh, the dresser that was inside of the closet. All right. Going here to 4L, um, what do we see here? Uh, the with the middle uh, drawers of the dresser inside the closet, um, specifically the left drawer that has photo marker number two. Mm -hmm. And what was located in that drawer? That was in, uh, a black buck sh brand sheath that was empty inside of that drawer. All right, and then for four M's, it's just a close up of that sheath that was found? Yes. And was that collected and placed in evidence? It was. Going back uh, to going to four in, what 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 is this? That's another photograph of the dresser where the items on the right side of the dresser between the dresser and the wall were removed. Right, and then four O. Uh, photo marker number three, where items of evidence were located at the bottom. And what a particular interest was located in this area? Uh, it was one pair of wet, a uh, white Nike brand high top athletic shoes with possible blood. And uh, All right, I'm, I'm going to go to 4P. Uh, okay. 
Is, are those the shoes that you refer to? Yes. And were they removed from that location? Yes. All right, and then going to states four Q and R, what are? Those are. Sorry. Just overalls of the shoes. And you indicated that um, there was substance found on these shoes? Yes. And what did it appear to be? Possible blood. And were those, and you said the shoes were wet? Yes. And were those shoes collected and placed in evidence? They were. And then were they sent, um, later sent to FTLE for analysis? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, photograph 4S, what do we see in this photograph? That is a white t-shirt that was located underneath the dresser when the dresser was removed from the closet. And that was brought to your attention and you took photographs of it? Yes. Was there anything unusual about this white t-shirt that was found behind that dresser? It had possible blood on it also. And is that seen in this photograph? Yes. Right. And then photograph 4T. Just a close-up of the, the bottom portion of the t-shirt. And was this shirt also sent to FDLE for analysis? Yes. Move to four U. What do, what do we see in this photograph? It's a pair of blue jeans. And where were those blue jeans found? Those were in a laundry basket in that room. All right. And was there anything unusual about these particular pair of blue jeans? Uh, they appeared damp. Um, and then when I got them back to the office, you could see possible blood. All right. Um, so you, they were collected in place in evidence? Yes. And were they sent to FDLE for analysis? Yes. All right. Moving here to four V. Um, what do we see generally in this photograph? This is an overall view of the desk that was in the room. Was there anything of particular interest found on this desk? Um, there were some drawings uh, that were located on the desk that were photographed. Right. Moving here to 4W, um, do we see any of the drawings in this photograph? Uh, at the top of the photograph underneath the water bottle is one of the drawings. Right. Were any photographs found in any of the composition books that were located or notebooks that were found on that desk? Uh, the black book in the left, uh, bottom left corner underneath the water jug had a photo, uh, a drawing also that was photographed. Right. And going here, states 4X, which, which of those, was this one of the notebooks or the? Yes. Right. And that, this is what the, found in the notebook under the water jug? Yes. going to states for why um, what is this and where was it found that was another drawing and I don't recall where that one was found but it was in the vicinity of the desk yes okay. and states for Z what is this and where was it found that is the drawing that was underneath the, the water bottle that was at the top of the first photograph Again, all these items were found in Aiden Fuji's bedroom? Correct. Did you also attend um, the autopsy of Tristan Bailey? I did. And did you, what was your general role um, during the performance of the autopsy? I photographed the autopsy um, and also collected evidence. Did you, as a part of that process, did you collect um, DNA standards um, from Tristan Bailey? I did. Okay, and that would have been like a um, bugle swabs, things that, you uh, know, blood standard that could yes. identify her DNA. One moment, Your Honor. Okay. Was there anything found within Tristan's body um, that you collected in evidence that was later sent to FDLE? Uh, yes. Um, I was advised that Dr. Bulick had located a possible metal fragment in her scalp. Okay. And did you um, obtain that from the medical examiner's office and send that to FDLE for analysis? I did. Thank you, Ron. Nothing further. Good 
Good morning. <clears throat> and um, I'm just going to start at the beginning where the state started, <clears throat> which takes us back to the scene. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was no evidence that that body had been moved, dragged to the location where it was found. Is I did true? not see anything. Okay. And the pictures that you took are how you first observed the body? Correct. So it wasn't, it wasn't covered in the palmettos that were available? It wasn't covered in anything? No, it was exactly how it, okay. when I arrived on scene. Not buried, not covered in dirt, just like we saw in the picture? Yes. The items um, in the composite of photos was letter S, and it was the items that were found next to her or in her vicinity, the vape pen, the money. Yes. Um, the picture that we saw, that's you putting them together. That's not where they were found on the scene? No, that's exactly where but they, they were, were found, found on the scene. I understand. The okay. photograph where they were separated out, I did. That's what my question is, okay. So, The uh, pictures, letters X, Y, and Z that you recovered from his bedroom. I just want to kind of skip ahead to that. Those three pictures that we, the last three pictures we showed. The drawings? Yes. Okay. Um, some of those were, were on the table. Some of them were inside of a journal. All of them were on the desk, whether they were in a, one was in a journal, I do believe, mm -hmm. uh, that was shown when it, it was on the back portion of the journal, mm -hmm. and the others were on the desk. Um, were there other pictures in that journal besides that one? No, I would have photographed anything that was in there. Okay. The white t-shirt that was found under the dresser. Yes. Um, that t-shirt wasn't wet, was it? It didn't appear to be wet, no. Okay. And, and you don't know when that t-shirt was put under that dresser? No. And um, while you testified there was possibly blood on it, it wasn't was it ever uh, returned from FDLE with the presence of blood on it? I believe. Was it tested for blood? Yes, it was tested for blood. Okay. Uh, it gave the chemical indications for the presence of blood. Okay. My question, I guess, is you don't know when it was put under there, underneath the dresser? No. Okay. So while the shoes were wet and the, and the jeans you testified were wet, the shirt wasn't? It didn't appear to be, no. Okay. The jeans were just recovered inside a laundry basket? Yes. Okay. And um, as far as the drawings go, you don't have any personal knowledge as to who created those drawings, do you? I do not. Okay. Thank you. Can you read the right? All right. Thank you, ma'am. We're free to go. <clears throat> State, you may call your next witness. State Hall Sergeant Kurt and raise your right hand <clears throat> do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you God yes sir all right you can come on up here and have a seat in the witness stand thank you yeah go ahead and adjust that how you like uh, good morning sir if you would introduce yourself to the court my name is Kurt Hannon. And how are you employed? I am a sergeant with the St. John's County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with <clears throat> St. John's? Approximately seven and a half years. And what is your educational background? I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. What's your current role at the Sheriff's Office? I am a sergeant on patrol. And what was your role back in May of 2021? I was a corporal in our major crimes unit. How long had you served in major crimes at that point? <clears throat> Excuse me, um, approximately two and a half years. 
I want to direct your attention to May 9th, 2021. Uh, were you working or on call on that date? I was, yes. Okay. Working or on call? Uh, on call. Okay. Um, when and how do you get alerted that there's an investigation into a missing teenager in St. John's? Uh, at approximately 2.33 p.m., I received a phone call from my supervisor, Major Crown Unit Sergeant David Garns, um, notifying me that there's a, a missing juvenile investigation, and I was asked to come and assist. Okay. Up until approximately that point, uh, patrol was sort of handling that investigation, but it was transitioning over to investigations. Is that fair? Y yes. About that point? Okay. Um, where did you respond, and who were you briefed by? I responded to the North Amenity Center in Durham Crossing at 7.30 North Durham Parkway. I met with, <coughs> excuse me, um, Deputy Robert Maloney and uh, spoke to him. Okay. And did he inform you of the information he had up until that point? Yes, he advised me of information he had gotten from speaking with the Bailey family initially um, and speaking with two subjects identified as uh, Dolphus Absher, who goes by the name of Trey, and Aiden Fuji. And was uh, Aiden Fucci and or Trey um, with law enforcement at that time? Yes, they were detained in law enforcement vehicles. Okay. What do you do at that point? Do you stay on scene or, or do you go do something else? Um, I was on scene for a while. I transitioned to our staging area at Veterans Park when more resources started coming in. And I eventually moved to a Northwest Field office uh, located at 725 Floor Branch Boulevard. Um, does something get brought to your attention uh, in the early parts of this investigation in reference to Aiden Fucci's cell phone and activity on that phone? Uh, yes, I was advised that he was posting to social media from the backseat of the patrol car. And what did you do in response to that? I uh, requested that his phone be seized so that we could preserve any potential evidence based on that phone. And what app or application did you learn Aiden Fucci was using to post to social media while being detained? Snapchat. Did you later obtain records from Snapchat confirming those yes, uh, posts and videos? Yes, ma'am. objection state could move in to admit states g uh, for the record this is a business record certification from snapchat and a selection of those um, videos to publish today in court any objection okay. without objection that will be received as uh, state's next numbered exhibit five. number five thank you Permission to publish, Your Honor. And detective, um, there's a there's a photo. Kind of describe what we have here with the the four things we're going to display to the court. What each one of them is. So the first one you see on the left is the original photo, um, and you can see where it's date and time stamped there in the name of the file. The second photo on the right is just a text banner that Snapchat overlays the text banner on top of that picture. And then the last two were videos. Okay. And I'm going to start here with the photograph and then kind of have you explain that again as we open it up. Um, let me open this. And so for the record, I'm uh, publishing States 5, a photograph of, um, just describe what you see here. Um, that would be uh, Aiden Fucci um, taking a picture in the reflection of the, uh, the barrier glass in between the front compartment and the, the rear compartment of the vehicle where um, passengers sit. Okay. And how Snapchat returns the results to you, they also gave you this file. Um, what is this state? This is the text banner that was overlaid on top of that picture with the Snapchat post. And what does it say for the record? Um, hey guys, has anybody seen Tristan lately? Okay. And so just so the court understands, this picture was displayed with that text over top of it yes to the user on the snapchat and that would see it yes okay and do you know approximately when this was posted that day? um it would be in the the timestamp, so it would be on the 9th of may at approximately 4 52 p.m 
And then um, I'm just going to play the next two videos um, that you received from Snapchat of interest. Fun in a fucking cop car. Yep. Tristan. What's up, guys? Yeah. Tristan, if you fucking walk out the damn. When you see this in a mock we're, we're having fun in a fucking cop car. Yep. Tristan. What's up, guys? Yeah. Tristan, if you fucking walk out the damn. When you see this in a mock Then I'm going to play the next one. Snapchat indicates these file names are under memories. What is that? Uh, does that mean it's something that the public can see or he directly sent to like one individual? No, that basically it's your homepage, if you will, your, um, the, the snaps that you post, they're posted to your memories and, and basically everybody can see those that you're friends with. Okay. All right, so you're advised that that sort of thing is going on, ask that his phone be taken. Um, at this time, are there detectives tasked with searching for video based on the information you had from Trey and Aiden at this point? Yes. Okay. Um, what information, kind of what area of the neighborhood were they focusing on that time for video based on so what you knew? So based on the initial information that they obtained from Trey and from uh, Aiden is that uh, Aiden and Tristan had left from Trey's house at about 1 a.m. and were walking north along Durban Parkway, and they mentioned the amenity center. So we went to the amenity center to look for video there. Okay. And what did you learn uh, from the amenity center video? Uh, there were two subjects that were seen walking past the amenity center, I believe, at approximately 1.24 a.m., which was consistent with the direction and time frame. As the investigation continues on that day, when was um, Tristan's body uh, alerted to your agency that it was discovered? The, the sheriff's office received a phone call from a subject named Daniel Hart, who advised at, at 6.06 p.m., um, who advised that he had been out in a wooded area and found a deceased body at that point. Okay. What happens with the investigation at that point, and specifically, what is your role? Uh, at that point, it transitions into a homicide investigation, and I was designated as the case agent. Do you go out to the crime scene at that point in the woods, or what do you do? Uh, I did not. Um, crime scene technician Marilyn Butts was tasked to go out to the scene where she was located to process that scene and collect evidence, and then I was um, kind of gathering information and looking at what the next steps were in the investigation. Do you proceed to write a series of, of search warrants for various residences and, and places? Yes, we began to secure several different residences um, to either obtain consent to search from the homeowner or to draft search warrants. And based on the location now of Tristan's body, um, are there detectives that are dispatched to that area to search for video? Yes. Okay. And sort of throughout the night, um, where do you end up stationed where you're drafting warrants and things like that? I'm at the Northwest Field Office. Okay. As information comes in from video that's being located, does that um, relate to you? Yes. Okay. As you're working on warrants and, and afterwards, what information of importance becomes available from surveillance in the Saddlestone uh, Drive area? Uh, we first got video, I believe, at approximately 7.54 uh, p.m. from a residence at 541 Saddlestone Drive. Um, on that video, it depicted two subjects walking east past the residence in the direction of the cul-de-sac on Saddlestone Drive. Um, one subject appeared to be taller, and this was at the video captured then at 1.45 a.m. Um, one subject appeared to be taller um, and could be seen wearing a pair of white shoes with a black Nike swoosh. Uh, the next video was at 3.27 a.m., and there was only one subject that was seen uh, walking west away from the cul-de-sac that same subject uh, wearing, that was previously wearing shoes? Yes, um, and at 327, it was a, the, it appeared to be the taller subject who was previously wearing the shoes, and now the subject appeared to be carrying the shoes in his hand. Okay, and <coughs> later that night, um, approximately an hour later, did detectives locate more video from Saddlestone that was helpful? Yes, we located video at 586 Saddlestone Drive, which for reference is in the direction of the cul-de-sac from the first residence, 541. Um, on this video, there were two subjects observed walking east towards the cul-de-sac at 1.46 a.m., and they appeared to be <coughs> a 
excuse me, the same two subjects. And then the next video shows one subject um, appearing to be the taller subject from the first video as well. Um, the subject was running west away from the cul-de-sac at approximately 3.27 a.m. And you can see that in the video that he was carrying something in his hands. Okay. You're finding that information out warrants are being executed. Where was the defendant ultimately brought uh, and put at your agency? He was transported to our Central Investigations Division and placed in an audio and video recorded room um, and his parents were allowed to be in there with him. Okay. Was your agency able to, did you attempt and were you able to get into Aiden Fucci's phone that night? We obtained a search warrant um, to do a forensic download of his phone. Um, however, Detective Causey, who was our digital forensics um, detective at that point in time advised that uh, due to the technical constraints of the phone, we weren't able to actually get a download from it. Um, so we weren't able to get a download that night. That night, okay. And the court has heard about um, the processing of 724 Castledale and the, the items of evidence that were removed from that room. Um, you were advised of those items, the I was, shoes. Yeah. Sure. Um, Go ahead and just describe what you were made aware of from. Uh, I was advised there was a, uh, a buck knife sheath that was empty, did not have a knife with it. There was a pair of uh, white Nike tennis shoes with the black swoosh that were wet that were located behind a dresser in the closet that tested positive the presence of blood. There was a white t-shirt that tested positive the presence of blood. There was a pair of wet jeans that we obtained from the laundry hamper. And there was a uh, the drain trap from the bathroom adjacent to um, Aiden Fucci's bedroom. Uh, the drain trap tested positive the presence of blood, and we also um, collected the DVR video surveillance system from the home. Okay, um, detectives and investigators that were in that Castledale home that night noticed. Um, what about surveillance about that home? That there was there were video cameras on both the outside and the inside of the home. Did you also draft a search warrant that night to collect evidence from the body of Aiden Fucci, collect yes. a buccal swab, yes. um, photograph him, things like that? Major case friends, yes ma'am. Okay. Did your agency make a decision about an arrest of Aiden Fucci early, in the early morning hours of the 10th? Yes ma'am. We um, arrested him and charged him with second degree murder at approximately 3.30 a.m. Okay. I want to move to the next morning, May 10th. Um, what do you do, I guess it was 3.30 in the morning already, but uh, business hours the next morning, what are you doing? Uh, I attended autopsy, which began at approximately 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Investigation-wise, <clears throat> what um, sort of two things did you walk away from that autopsy and knowing and learning? Uh, we learned that there were uh, 114 stab wounds and that there was a metal fragment that was located with an x-ray that was located in Tristan's scalp. Was there an effort to locate uh, a possible murder weapon in this case, a sharp, a sharp force weapon, and what efforts were made? Yes, um, approximately noon, our, our field force teams and our dive teams deployed to the wooded area that Tristan was located um, in attempts to locate uh, items of evidence. Our field force team searched the wooded area, and our dive team searched two ponds in that area. Okay, were you present for? Um, all are part of that search effort? Yes, after I um, attended autopsy, after that concluded, I joined the search efforts um, that were in progress still. And was that search effort successful in covering uh, evidence? It was. At approximately uh, 6.30 p.m., um, a dive team member located a folding buck brand knife in the pond. Um, the knife appeared to have the tip of the, the knife was bent and the very edge of it was uh, broken or fractured off. Were you present when that knife was recovered? I was. Without objection, state would move in states E and permission to publish. No objection. No objection, Your Honor. That would be received as states number six. Okay. 
6A is just an aerial of the general area that was searched um, by the dive team, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And states 6B and C uh, show that uh, area of the retention pond closest to where Tristan's body was located. If you kind of could describe who's seen in this video and anything of note in this video, or photograph, excuse me. So you're looking at the, from the first photo from A, you're looking at the larger of the ponds. This is looking in more of a southern direction. If you see the house on the right, that's the where the cul-de-sac of Saddlestone Drive is. <clears throat> Um, so the dive that's in the water is um, Deputy Todd Lewis of the Sheriff's Office, a member of the dive team. Okay. <clears throat> You're okay. Is he in the uh, proximate area or does he have marked where he recovers the knife? Yes. And um, if you could describe it and or, um, can you step down, Your Honor? So this is Deputy Delissa, and I believe the marker for the knife is probably right there. Okay. Brought up and collected was uh, photo documented by another crime scene technician on scene, technician Volmar, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And 6D, is that a... Uh, Photograph of that knife? Yes, ma'am. 6E and 6F. What does 6F show that angle? Uh, it shows the, um, the top of the blade and that the blade was bent. And then I think in 6D, uh, you can notice that the tip of that knife is broken off. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That's what you were referring to? Yes, ma'am. All right, on May 11th, moving forward in the investigation, um, was anything of evidentiary value learned um, on that date in relation to video from the Fuji residents? Yes, uh, Detective Causey had been reviewing video from the DVR system we collected during a search warrant and located video that shows um, Aiden uh, coming to the residence at approximately 3.32 a.m. Um, in the video, you can see that he's carrying his shoes with his hands. Um, the shoes that he was carrying were a pair of white Nike shoes with black swoosh. Um, so he enters into his residence, he goes upstairs to his bedroom, um, comes out of his bedroom wearing what appears to be a bathrobe and goes into the adjacent bathroom for a short period of time. And then um, after he's in the bathroom for a little while, he comes out and goes back to his bedroom. Okay. And. <clears throat> Throughout this investigation and, and towards the end, as your agency's collecting all the video surveillance, um, did you and others work on, and was a presentation worked on for court purposes to show a timeline of AIDS movements that day? Yes, ma'am. And as your agency was collecting video, um, was the times being verified and documented if any, um, there was any discrepancy in the video times? Yes, ma'am. Without objection at this time, the state would introduce states F and permission to publish. What is states F? I'm sorry. States F is a um, video surveillance uh, presentation. Any objection? No objection. That'll be received as states exhibit number seven. Okay, and just so um, the court is aware, just kind of overall describe uh, in this presentation what these map slides show and the information. So this is a, an overview of the um, northern part of the Durban Crossing neighborhood, just to orient you. Um, the yellow road along your right-hand side there is St. John's Parkway, um, or 20, County Road 2209. The road that kind of comes to the south of that, the main road is Longleaf Pine Parkway. Um, and then the road kind of going up to the middle of all of that is North Urban Parkway. Um, looking at going from south to north, 
Um, you see the green arrow is the Absher residence at 145 Telford Drive. Um, that's where Trey lives. Um, the Bailey residence is there in yellow. The Fuji residence at 724 Castle Mill Court is there at the top in yellow. And then where Tristan was located um, is there in red at the end of Salisone Drive. Okay. And in the top right of the map, there's information on the video that plays right after the map, um, time and location. Is that right? Yes. And then on the aerial as well, you see a little brink, blinking green camera. Is that the location of the video that would play after this? Yes. Okay. And so what time were you guys actually able to go back and sort of start tracking Mr. Fucci's movements that day? So uh, we picked up his movements at approximately 5.17 p.m. on the uh, afternoon of May 8th, which would have been Saturday. Okay. And the video that we're about to see is from what location? Uh, it's from 103 Wellwood Avenue, and it depicts um, Aiden traveling to the Absher residence. Okay. And um, the next video is going to be um, at what time and what location? It's at 6:25 p.m. And this is at uh, the video is actually from 144 Telford Drive, which is across the street from the Absher residence. Okay. And who is um, determined to be depicted in this video? It would be Aiden and Trey. Um, the next video we're going to show the time, same location, but what's the time and, and then who do we see? At 6.31 p.m. and it's Aiden and Trey and Zofi responds to Trey's residence as well. And who did you determine through the investigation uh, Zofi was in relation to Aiden Fuji? <clears throat> Zofi was Aiden Fuji's girlfriend. Okay. That's going to be Zofi coming on the skateboard towards the house. Okay, in the next video, same location, what time? At 6.43 p.m. And what does it depict? Uh, it depicts Aiden and Zofi leaving Trey's residence. Now we've moved. Do you see the camera? Um, the blinking camera's actually gone a little south of the Absher residence down there. What location is this? That's at 100 Woodcross Drive. That is the that's Sylvia's residence. Okay. And they arrived there approximately 6:50. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then just one minute later, same residence? Yes. Different camera? Yes. And what did you note of relevance in this video, if anything? Um, starting from the bottom of the top of Aiden, you can see he's wearing white Nike shoes with a black Nike swoosh. He's wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. And at 8.08 .08 p.m., um, what does this next video show? Uh, it's again at Woodcross Drive, and it shows Aiden leaving um, Zofia's residence. You can see he's still wearing blue jeans and white Nike shoes. Okay, and this time he has a hoodie on over yes. his clothes. And um, Zofi doesn't leave that time. Aiden leaves by himself, is that right? Correct. Is that consistent with information <coughs> you obtained uh, from her? Yes. Okay. And so it's now 8.14. Um, 
what do we see here? Uh, we're back out at 144 Telford Drive across the street from Trey's residence and it shows Aiden coming back to Trey's house. And this is just him ringing the, um, this next video is him ringing the doorbell, is that right? Yes. Okay. You see that he has the hoodie on. Do you still see a white shirt underneath? I do. He's also still wearing blue jeans. And at the beginning of the video, you can see he's still wearing uh, white Nike shoes. Okay. And 927 is the next time video's captured and we're still at uh, the Apshire residence, is that right? Yes. Basically, and what does this video depict? It's showing Trey and Aiden um, in the driveway skateboarding. <coughs> and was that those actions consistent with what Trey kind of described that they did that night hanging out before yes. Tristan came over? Yes. Now this next video, um, what is this? So this is on uh, 32 Closer Main Drive. You can see it's east from the Bailey residence. And it depicts a subject. Uh, we learned that Tristan had left the house um, at approximately midnight-ish. And this kind of shows that there's a subject that's walking um, east away from the residence approximately the time frame that uh, we believe she left the house. Okay, and then we see the green camera has now moved to Telford Drive. Um, what's the actual time on this video? This is at 12.35 a.m. And it's um, a subject that we believe to be Tristan walking on Telford Drive towards uh, Absher's residence. And now the video is going to depict a different time, but that was verified by law enforcement. The accurate time is 12.35. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And then from 1235, the next video, same location, correct? Tell yes. us the time and what do you see in this video? This is now 118 <clears throat> a.m. and this is the morning of the 9th um, at 110 Telford Drive and it shows two subjects. Uh, we I believe to be Tristan and Aiden walking north on Telford Drive away from Trey's residence. And then this was actually one of the first videos your agency located. Uh, you referenced earlier uh, the amenity center video, is that right? Yes, ma'am. There were uh, at 1220, correction, 124 a.m. Um, was when we observed the two subjects walking north past the amenity center. Okay. At the time, obviously, the quality of this video is not great in and of itself, right? Correct. Um, but having now all of the video, you've gone back and pieced it all together. Yes, the, okay. the, the travel time and the walking distance is all consistent. And where are we going to see them come from in the video? Uh, you're going to see them coming from the left, top left part of the screen to the top right part of the screen. This video shows the, uh, the entrance to the amenity center with a little roundabout there. And that roundabout is uh, it's off of North Urban Parkway, so they're traveling north. You still can kind of see the white shoes there if you're watching for those, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and next, uh, 126 a.m., what intersection is this? This is still along North Urban Parkway, and this is at the intersection of Leith Hall Drive, and it shows two subjects walking north okay. along North Urban Parkway still, and it's consistent with the direction and time frame. Okay, and the Leith Hall Drive was um, <coughs> a location that um, Deputy Maloney actually got some information about, uh, from Fuji about an interaction he claims happened about this location, right? Yes, ma'am.
And with what the camera is able to capture here, you don't see any sort of altercation between these two at this location? Sir? No, ma'am. And now we've gone up towards the north part of the neighborhood. It's um, 143. And are these some of those Saddlestone videos that you referenced earlier that became important? Uh, there were, this was one of other videos along Saddlestone Drive that we located, yes. Right. And this, so this is at 1.43 a.m. And it's going to show the two subjects walking from the top left to the top right. And they're traveling in a direction east towards the cul-de-sac. Of Saddlestone. And Detective now, Sergeant, excuse me, uh, your agency and, and you, you've reviewed so much video in this case. Um, do you ever see anyone else with who we now know as Aiden, Fucci, and Tristan walking in that neighborhood? No. With them, meaning no third party correct. is seen once they leave Trey's house to the end of the cul de sac, correct? Correct. There's only two subjects walking. And so. This next one is at what address? This is at 541 Saddleston. This is one of the videos that I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, it shows two subjects, um, Aiden and Tristan, walking east on Saddlestone Drive towards the cul-de-sac. Now we're at 586. Yes. Uh, same um, direction of travel, however, is um, this video taken from the opposite side of the street? Yes. Okay. So they're going to be coming from which direction? From right to left. Right to left, but it's still headed? In east towards the cul-de-sac. Towards the end of the cul-de-sac. Is this the um, last known video of Tristan that we have? Yes. So that time was um, determined accurate at 1.45 a.m. Uh, what is the next time and same video, same location, what's the next time we see something? It's 3.22 a.m. Um, this now we're going to be sold the same residence from the last one, 586 Saddleson Drive. And we're going to see one subject uh, who's alone and running west away from the cul-de-sac. <clears throat> you can see that he's carrying something in his hands. And now we're back to that. Second. Now we're, we're working backwards um, away from the cul-de-sac and so now we're back at 541 Saddlestone Drive and we're going to see uh, one subject, Aiden, walking west away from the cul-de-sac. What do you note of importance in this video? Uh, you see he's not wearing shoes but he's carrying something white in his hands. And now we're back at 517 Saddlestone approximately what time? Uh, this is at 3.29 a.m. And again, you can see that he's not wearing shoes, but he's carrying what appears to be white shoes in his hands. Okay, and now we are at 724 Castledale Court. That is his residence, correct? Yes. So Castledale Court intersects with Saddlestone Drive um, over towards your right on this video. And you can see him walking up to his house. Then approximately 331, another view. And here you can uh, clearly see the white Nike shoes with the black Nike swoosh. <laughs> so 
So now we're, um, like I said from earlier, the, the video surveillance system had video both inside and outside. So now we're seeing video of him coming in the house. <coughs> Where is he headed? So the, the stairwell there you see on the left or part of the screen, that's actually there's two different stairwells. If you go up those stairs, there's a small landing and it connects to a second set of stairs that goes down towards the kitchen area. And then at the landing, there's a set of stairs that go up towards the second floor. So he was sort of walking the kitchen way and would have been able to access the stairs from the backside. Is yes. that right? Okay. And then the next part of this, just so the court can orient himself when a video pops up, um, showing up the stairs. There's a big room to the left. Yes. Describe what that is and then what's beyond that room. Yep. So the big room to the left is more like a child's player area and there you can see the landing and the, the second set of stairs there on the right. Um, so he's walking past that. The light you see in the top right corner is from the bathroom that's adjacent to where his bedroom is and you can see him going into his bedroom. And again he's still carrying those white shoes. That's approximately 3.32? Yes, ma'am. And then when do we see him again? What time? Uh, 3.46. This is when um, he comes out of his bedroom, um, looks like he's wearing a bathrobe, and goes into the adjacent bathroom. And from 3.46... When do we see him exit the bathroom? At 4.17. This is when he comes out of the bathroom and goes back into his bedroom. Okay. All right. Sergeant, I want to turn your attention to um, May 12th in the investigation and at, at that time were you able to determine other than Trey um, maybe who his next closest friend or uh, the girlfriend I believe you mentioned yes yeah, so we identified that Trey was his best friend and that Sophie was his girlfriend okay did you learn anything um, from those individuals um, about whether they had knowledge that Aiden Fuji liked knives and things like that Yes, um, they both described him having a kind of a fascination with knives, um, that whenever he was in school he would carry knives, um, and that he would constantly take them out, display them, show them off, talk about them, um, those sorts of things. Did they I, um, identify that he had um, two favorites? Yes, they both um, stated that he had two knives in particular he liked, um, and he had named them, one was Picker and one was named Poker. And the knife that you were present that was recovered from the retention pond, those same photos that we saw here in court, um, were Trey and Zofi shown those photos to see if that was one of the knives they were aware of? Yes, and Trey and Zofi both identified that knife as the knife that Aiden named Poker. Was your agency eventually able to um, get into Aiden Fucci's cell phone and get a download from that? Yes, I think it was about June 29th. Um, Detective Cosby advised that the technical requirements allowed us to um, conduct a download. So we drafted a, an amended search warrant and submitted that for uh, forensic download of his phone. Okay. And when you're reviewing his forensic download, and, and specifically in reference to the timeline you're trying to put together that night in contact between Fucci, um, Aiden Fucci, and Tristan, what sort of things did you find? Uh, so, looking at the evening of May 8th, um, it was about 10.40 p.m., uh, we found a message that Tristan had sent to uh, Aiden <clears throat> through Snapchat. Um, that was a message that it, it wasn't sent just to him, it was sent to a lot of different people. It was um, some of her contacts. Um, <clears throat> so that was the, the first message that we saw that night. Um, the next uh, time mark in his phone, uh, I believe it was approximately midnight, 24 hours. So 12.24 a.m. in the morning of the 9th, um, when Aiden's phone shows that a contact for Tristan was created in his phone. Um, and then at 12.25, there's a uh, phone call followed by a FaceTime call that lasts for approximately six minutes um, from Aiden to Tristan. 
and at 12:36 a.m. there's a phone or a FaceTime call from Tristan Dewey. Okay, and is that sort of consistent with um, her leaving the house and eventually that between 12ish and 12:30 when she arrives at the yes, afternoon? And is there any activity by him um, on his phone um, after about 1 a.m. until what time? So the the next activity after that FaceTime call interaction between he and uh, or Aiden's phone and Tristan, um, the next activity on that phone is at 1:11 a.m. on the morning of May 9th, and that is a phone call that went from um, Aiden to Trey, which went unanswered. Um, what that tells us is that they weren't together at that point in time, and it's consistent with um, information that Aiden and Tristan had left at approximately 1.10 a.m. from Trey's house. Okay. Is there any activity on his cell phone, user-generated activity on his cell phone from that time until what time the next day? Uh, approximately 9.27 a.m. Did you have an opportunity in your investigation to review the recording of Aiden and his parents um, that occurred in an interview room at your agency. I did, yes. And at least at the at the time, that was that night, right? Um, what of importance did you take away from from that, or other <laughs> detectives were reporting to you um, that Aiden talked about in that video? Um, so one of the statements made during that video is, um, again, Aiden was in the room with his parents and they were having conversations. And uh, Aiden's mom asked him if he was wearing jeans. Um, and Aiden initially said yes. And then his mother um, tried to, she told him that um, she thought he was wearing khakis and asked if he was wearing khakis instead. The jeans were important because, um, you know, later after reviewing all the video and seeing the, the jeans in the video from the daytime, the nighttime it gets kind of harder to see it. Um, but the daytime shows he's wearing the jeans. And we did locate wet jeans in his bedroom as well. That also tested positive for blood, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Your Honor, I don't have any further questions of this witness at this time. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> so, part of how you excluded Trey from the investigation was based on the fact that Aiden made a phone call to him at 1.11 that morning? Not based on that, solely. Not solely, okay. But that was part of, part of your decision making there? More or less, um, maybe not at that time specifically, but. And just to kind of pick up where the state left off, when you um, finally got to download the material on um, Mr. Fucci's phone around June 29th, um, none of the Snapchat had been deleted, correct? I, I, I don't know. Um, we use programs to, to look and review downloads, um, and I can only see what I can see, basically. So um, I'm not a technical expert, to, to, to say, uh, but uh, those were what I found to be, um, I guess, that was what I could find. So. Um, so there's no evidence. Is, is there? Is it true that there was no evidence that any he made any efforts to delete material from his phone? I don't know that I can answer that. You can't answer that. And I would include in that any FaceTiming. Can, can you answer that question, or is that outside your expertise? I don't think you can delete a FaceTime call record from your phone. Okay. Okay. Um, May 10th, you attended the autopsy, and just to be clear. And I apologize, it's kind of gruesome to talk about, but um, Ms. Bailey's hands were attached to her body, correct? Her hands were attached to her body? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, the body wasn't burned, anything like that, right? I, I don't believe it was burned. Uh, when you were part of the recovery team that found the knife, um, that knife was recovered in the pond closest to where the body was found, correct? I mean, I would say it was, it was in the, the larger pond closer to where she was found, yes. Thank you. Uh, and there, we saw from the aerials that there's several ponds in that area. There were two. Okay. Um, and when you recovered the knife, the knife wasn't disassembled in any way, right? No. 
It was recovered in one whole piece? Yes, it was unfolded just as you saw in the pictures. <clears throat> the video from the Fuji residence um, shows him taking a shower. There's no other video of him doing anything else in the house, is that correct? There were no um, cameras in the bedroom, no. Okay. Or outside of the house, we've seen all the video of him outside of the house? Yes, what we saw in the video is what we saw as well. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you, Judge. All right. Just one question, Your Honor. In the review of all of the video surveillance from the various streets that you had in this case, was Trey Doffus Apshur ever seen, um, clearly not with them, we already established that, was he ever seen leaving his house, walking alone, anything like that? No. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. All right. May this witness be excused? All right, sir, you're free to go. Thank you. It is... Uh, 11 or 1047 is a good time for a break. Let's take a recess for 15 minutes. <clears throat>
Say Judge got a circuit court order for an order. You can all be seated, thank you. <clears throat> all right, State, you may call your next uh, witness. Maybe if you'll pause right there and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide? Yes, I do. All right, if you'll step one up into the mic. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, ma'am. Could you please state your name for the record? My name is Brooke Hoover. I'm a crime laboratory analyst for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Ms. Hoover, how, have, how long have you been so employed with FDLE? 12 years. I want to just kind of jump right into this case. Um, I know normally we talk a lot about DNA in, in a trial setting. I don't think that's necessary here. So um, let me just ask you, ma'am, um, in May and June of 2000, I'm sorry, in um, May of 2021, were you assigned to conduct um, DNA testing on a number of items of evidence from a, an investigation by the St. John's County Sheriff's Office that was in connection with a victim by the name of Tristan Bailey. Yes. All right, I want to ask you about some of the items specifically of evidence that you received. Did you receive um, DNA standards that were identified as coming from Tristan Bailey as well as Aiden Fucci? Yes. And did you conduct DNA testing on those items? Yes, I did. And were you able to develop uh, profiles of, of both Tristan Bailey and Aiden Fucci? Yes. Did you also receive an item that was identified as a white American Eagle t-shirt? Yes. All right, and did you conduct DNA testing on that item? Yes, I did. All right, was there anything um, unusual about the shirt itself, something that kind of focused your attention in terms of DNA testing? I was looking at reddish brown staining, uh, tested positive for blood. Okay, and where were those reddish brown stains located that you tested? They were on the front and back of the shirt. Okay. Did you do anything to determine whether or not those reddish brown stains were actually blood? Yes, I used a chemical color change test and all of the stains I took for DNA testing did give chemical indications for blood. And what did you do next? I took cuttings of the stains and I took a wearer sample from the back of the shirt and those samples went forward for DNA testing. Okay. And you, if I understand correctly, you tested four areas of the shirt, including the, the, um, the area that you tested for wearer DNA, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, can, let's talk about... Um, can you describe which areas of the shirt, not counting the, the, the collar that you did the wear DNA, what areas of the shirt did you actually conduct testing on? There was a stain in the center front of the shirt. It had the darkest reddish brown staining on the item. I took a cutting from that. I took a cutting from the back left sleeve, and I took a cutting from the back bottom of the shirt. All right. So with regard to the cutting from the center front of the shirt, um, did you um, obtain DNA results from that yeah. area? Yes, I did. And what were the res what was um, the results as it pertained specifically to Tristan Bailey and Aiden Fucci? Tristan, it was a two-person mixture. Tristan Bailey was included as a possible contributor to the mixed DNA profile. The observed mixed DNA profile is greater than 700 billion times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Tristan Bailey and one unrelated individual than from two unrelated individuals. Aiden Fucci was excluded as a contributor to that mixed DNA profile. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the, um, the cutting that you took from the back left sleeve, did you obtain DNA results from that area? Yes. And what were those results specifically as it related to Aiden Fucci and Tristan Bailey? It was a complete DNA profile consistent with a male individual. That DNA profile matched the DNA profile from Aiden Fucci. The observed DNA profile was greater than 700 billion times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Aiden Fucci than from an unrelated individual. 
and then the um, area, the cutting from the back bottom right of that white t-shirt. Um, did you obtain DNA results from that area? Yes, that was a three-person mixture. Aiden Fucci, Aiden Fucci is included as a possible contributor to the mixed DNA profile. The observed mixed DNA profile is greater than 700 billion times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Aiden, Fucci, and two unrelated individuals than from three unrelated individuals. Tristan Bailey is included as a possible contributor to the mixed DNA profile. The observed mixed DNA profile is greater than 700 billion times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Tristan Bailey and two unrelated individuals than from three unrelated individuals. Thank you. And then the, um, the area, the inside back collar that you sampled for wear DNA, did you obtain a um, result from that area? Yes, that was a two-person mixture. Aiden Fucci was included as a possible contributor to the mixed DNA profile. The observed mixed DNA profile is greater than 700 billion times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Aiden Fucci and one unrelated individual than from two unrelated individuals. Tristan Bailey was excluded as a contributor to the mixed DNA profile. Okay, thank you. Did you also receive a pair of white Nike tennis shoes for DNA testing? Yes. Did you observe any potential blood on those shoes? Yes. All right. And where were those, um, where were those stains located? I took a sample of staining from the left shoe. Um, the sample I took forward for DNA testing was above a top lace hole on the left side. That area tested positive for blood. I took a cutting from the shoe forward for DNA testing. All right. And what were, and, and did you obtain results? Yes. And what were those results specifically as it related to Tristan Bailey and Aiden Fucci? A partial DNA profile consistent with a female was obtained from the shoe. This DNA profile matches the DNA profile from Tristan Bailey. The observed DNA profile is greater than 700 billion times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Tristan Bailey than from an unrelated individual. All right, and I want to take you to um, another item that you sent to you. Um, did you receive um, did you re receive swabs that were identified as coming from a buck knife? Yes, I did. And how many swabs did you receive? Two swabs from the knife. One was from the handle. The other was from the blade. Right. And what did you do with the, um, the swab from the buck knife handle? The buck knife handle, um, it gave chemical indications for the presence of blood. I did take it forward for DNA testing, but due to the limited nature of the DNA results obtained, the data was not interpretable. And what about the swab of the buck knife blade? The swab from the blade gave chemical indications for the presence of blood. I obtained a mixture consistent with two donors, including at least one male contributor. Tristan Bailey is included as a possible contributor to the mixed DNA profile. The observed mixed DNA profile is greater than 700 billion times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Tristan Bailey and one unrelated individual than if it originated from two unrelated individuals. When I compared the DNA profile from Aiden Fucci to the mixture, it failed to demonstrate sufficient statistical support for inclusion or exclusion. Therefore, no determination can be made regarding the contribution of Aiden Fucci to this item. Now let me go to, did you receive a pair of American Eagle blue jeans? Yes, I did. Um, can you describe the, those jeans as they first appeared to you? This, the jeans had staining on them. It appeared faint yellowish, and I circled areas of interest. Um, every area that I tested, I tested by taking small cuttings, and um, all areas tested gave chemical indications for the presence of blood. Okay, 
You said that there were multiple areas of light yellowish staining? Yes. And you tested each of those areas? Uh, I guess you, you, did you test them for blood? Yes, I did. Okay, and each of those areas tested positive for blood? Each area that I tested was positive for blood, yes. Do you know how many specific areas um, you took samples from? Nine. And did you conduct a DNA testing? Yes, I did. And what? And were you able to, what were the, your results? None of the results were suitable for me to make any comparisons. Some of them were complex, which means there were four or more donors. Some of them I could not determine the number of donors, and some of them were limited. Um, I could not use any of the samples for comparison. Um, let me ask you this, just for clarification purposes. I know that some of the language that you use, particularly with, um, for example, um, the areas where you there was a single source DNA profile, and you used the word match, uh, it, it matched that a particular person, and then in other areas where there was a mixture, you used the word inclusion, and then you provided some statistics um, to kind of explain sort of the significance of that finding. Can you kind of explain um, why use different terminology in each of those situations? Yes, when we're comparing a single source DNA profile to a reference standard um, and that person matches all of the areas tested, that's what we call a match. When we have a DNA mixture that originated from more than one individual and we're comparing a reference standard and there's common points, we call that a possible inclusion and we report the statistics to give weight or value to that inclusion. And when you, when you use when you, some of the statistics that you cited, for example, a, a lot of those you said that that, that person's profile, the inclusion of them was 700 billion times more likely than them and an unrelated individual than say two unrelated individuals. Um, what is the significance of that finding? When we have a very high likelihood ratio, it means that a random coincidental occurrence is not a likely explanation for the DNA evidence. We um, talk about both possible explanations of the evidence with the number of contributors to the mixture. Um, when I have a three-person mixture, I have to talk about both outcomes or both possible explanations for the evidence with three people on each side. So when one possible explanation is Aiden Fucci and two unrelated individuals, that's three people on one side of my explanation. The other possible explanation is three unrelated individuals. So the difference between the two would be the person of interest, but we do have to talk about <laughs> likelihood ratios with the number of people included in the mixture on both sides of our hypothesis. So when you say, you know, more likely 700 billion times more likely that it's him and an unrelated individual than two or three unrelated individuals you know we we're talking about 700 billion times that's almost 100 times the population of the world correct correct one moment your honor <clears throat> morning. It's a little different what we're doing today because it's a sentencing uh, and we didn't go through your entire CV. I'm not going to do that now either. <laughs> but because we are trying to make a record for the 25 year review, I'm going to ask you some questions. Your testing, did you employ any methods or procedures to recover DNA from the evidence in this case that in the past had not been successful in terms of the evidence yielding DNA uh, and STR DNA typing? The methods used, we can test an item and not get DNA results, and that doesn't mean the test wasn't accurate. Um, just sometimes those are the results. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Well, let me rephrase, or let me move forward then. Were the markers used in this case then the most comprehensive that your lab employs? Yes. All right. And are the markers the most potential for information? 
Yes, for the type of testing, STR DNA testing, this is the kit that my laboratory system uses. That's the kit that you're using currently? Yeah, currently, yes. All right. And can you explain how the DNA typing mixture patterns in this case were resolved? With computer software. All right. So again, you're not taking pencil and paper. You're relying on the STR software to do that? Yes, I am relying on software. And what's the name of the software? Um, it is called StarMix. All right. And do you feel that StarMix affords you uh, a far greater capability to take apart or resolve uh, the mixture and point out or identify the most likely contributors versus approaches that you had used in the past? Yes, it is the first probabilistic genotyping software that FDLE has employed, so there wasn't uh, software like this in the past and it was heavily validated and it's used by other laboratory systems across the U.S. and the world. All right. Now in terms of DNA typing an item of evidence such as the knife handle, for example, are you aware of any approach that would be superior to StarMix at detecting potentially assigning a statistical or probability assessment, or I mean estimate, to those results? From the knife handle, there were limited DNA results that were not interpretable, so the type of software to provide statistical association doesn't apply because the results themselves were not interpretable. Meaning there's no other, there, you're using the best approach you have. That's correct. All right. And did anything occur in the course of you working up the evidence in this case that may have compromised your ability to obtain uh, additional information than what you received from the subject to the DNA typing? No. Now, looking to the shirt, and I believe that's item number one. And on that shirt, for the stain from the back bottom right, yes, ma'am. All right, so on that, you had identified three potential donors. Correct. All right. And at least one male. Correct. All right. And the unknown donor, were you able to identify the sex on the unknown donor? No, I cannot tell the do uh, gender of the third donor to the mixture. All right. So to that particular one, you, there's three, or by your testing, you're identifying three people. Correct. All right. And then same item, the American Eagle t-shirt, you had some follow-up testing for submission four and five. And at that time, you were provided additional individuals, additional DNA profiles for comparison. That's correct. All right. And on the shirt, Dofus Abster was also identified as a contributor to the shirt. That is correct, uh, to the wearer sample. To the, the wearer shirt. sample. Yes, so that's correct. Earlier, that sample to the bottom right, where there's three individuals, Absher was not one of those three. He was in the inconclusive zone, so I cannot determine his contribution to that mixture. So we're still dealing with then, at this point, four people identified on this particular item. I cannot tell if the unknown person in that three-person mixture and the unknown person from the center front stain, I can't tell if that's the same person. I can't tell if that's a different person. I have very limited information, and where I have information in one mixture for that donor, I'm missing it in the other mixture. So I really cannot tell if it's the same person or if it's a different person. So then the number expands. So when I said now you're looking at potentially three people on the shirt, it could be more than four. These are comparable DNA mixtures. It's possible that I get a standard and compare it to these mixtures and there, it's possible that there's a person that could be included in both. It's possible that it, it is different. I just don't know, but I can say that this is comparable DNA information. All right. And you're seeing where I'm getting to yeah. in terms of you can't say how many people are on the shirt then. So Correct. All right. Then looking to um, 
and these are general questions, but in terms of DNA, um, the shirt is a fabric, right? So it's a, and it's got a high capacity to absorb DNA. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. All right. And in your experience, um, is DNA relatively stable once it's dried on a fabric? Yes. All right. And in general, or your general experience, can DNA be recovered or blood from blood that is weeks after it's deposited? Yes, it can. M months after? Yes, it can. Years after? Yes. All right. So then looking to the to the genes, you had nine samples. Correct. And oh, sorry, it's item number 16. Okay. So on the genes, you had nine samples. Correct. All right. And they all tested positive for blood. Correct. All right. And within those nine samples, again, you're using the star mix. And yes, I did use star mix, but the ultimate um, conclusion for these mixture, mixtures was not interpretable. And that's for all nine. Yes, all for right. all nine. Not star mix was not used on all nine. Some of them were limited, and I did not even attempt. Um, but ultimately, n none of these mixtures are interpretable. All right. And you had four or more potential donors on some of those samples? F at least four, yes. Okay. So then, turning to the, uh, to the fingernails, of uh, you would see some DNA for fingernails from Tristan Bailey. Fingernails. Can you repeat your question, please? Right. You received uh, DNA samples from the fingernails of Tristan Bailey. <coughs> Correct. I'll overrule the objection. <coughs> and were you able to attribute the defendant to the DNA of the fingernails of Tristan Bailey? No DNA results foreign to Tristan Bailey were obtained from her fingernail samples. And turning to the, to the knife, so again, just a couple of general questions, and I'm almost done here this morning. So the DNA can be deposited directly on most surfaces, sorry, surfaces, is that fair? Yes. And once dried is relatively stable? Yes. All right, and DNA be, can be recovered efficiently from a knife handle with a cotton swab? Yes, it can. All right, does handler DNA on a knife come from an individual applying or actually holding the instrument? Yes. Okay, and does grasping a knife cause skin cells then to transfer from the hand to the handle of the knife? Yes. And do you employ the same method for DNA recovery from the knife handle in this case that you previously used for knives or other objects in other cases? Yes. All right. And was there anything unusual about the knife <coughs> handle that would lead you to suspect that it may not be a potential good source for handler DNA? I did not actually have the knife in my custody. The samples were collected uh, by someone else and I only had the swabs. Did you see photos of it? I can't, uh, I did after. I don't believe I saw photos of it before I tested. Okay. Were any of the data recovered from the knife handle interpretable? No. Were you able to conclude that the defendant was a contributor to the DNA recovered from the knife blade? I was not able to make that determination. <clears throat> and were you in a situation where there's a large amount of female victim DNA on a knife blade you can use Y STR DNA typing to identify a trace or male contribution? We can attempt, yes. Okay. Will you explain why Y star DNA typing is effective in that type of circumstance? Um, y STR DNA testing is when we amplify DNA that is only found on the Y chromosome. And when we have samples where a female donor is overwhelming the male donor, this can be beneficial. And um, this actually was attempted in this case. And based on the YSTR typing that was carried out on the case, in this case, 
were you able to conclude that Aiden Fuji's DNA was on the knife blade? I was not the one that conducted the YSTR testing. I can read from someone else's report, but I want to be clear I was not the one that performed the testing. Is, is that okay? Okay, um, the no YSTR DNA results were obtained from the knife blade. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect. I only have a couple of questions and a redirect couple of areas. Uh, I want to go back to the questions you were asked about the wear DNA on the white t-shirt. Um, it was mentioned that um, you had conducted some follow-up testing and that an individual by the name of, or a profile from an individual by the name of Dolphus Absher was included within the wear sample. Um, were you in the course of your um, analysis and testing able to determine um, sort of the contribution rate between um, Aiden Fuji's contribution to that mixture versus Dolphus Absher's contribution rate? Yes, Dolphus Absher, his inclusion statistic was um, approximately 120,000 times more likely to occur if the sample originated from Dolphus Absher and one unrelated individual than from two unrelated individuals. Going back, the inclusion stat, the likelihood ratio for Mr. Fucci was greater than 700 billion. There was more of uh, Aiden Fucci's DNA profile seemingly present. And according to the software, um, when I looked at the mixture, I could tell that one donor was more prevalent than the other. And the software Set, um, deconvoluted the mixture and assigned contributor one as 82% of the mixture. Contributor two was at 18% of the mixture. Aiden Fucci was consistent as contributor one. Mr. Abschner was consistent as contributor two. So Aiden Fucci was 82% yes. of that, 82% uh, contributor to that mixture. Correct. Now, I also wanted to ask you about the, the samples of the genes that you tested, that you indicated that you, there was, um, you were not able to get results from, the, from your sampling, your testing of those samples. If someone were to, if, if DNA had been left behind and someone came after the fact and attempted to clean that, would it have an effect on your, potential effect on your ability to be able to um, identify DNA on those clothing item? Yes. Nothing further. All right, may this witness be excused? Yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. You're free to go. State, you may call your next witness. State calls Detective Tyler Thompson. Sir, if you'll pause right there and raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? So help me God. All right, you can come on up here and have a seat in the witness stand. Good morning, sir. Could you please state your name for the record? Detective Tyler Thompson. And how are you employed, sir? St. John's County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been employed with St. John's County? I've been in law enforcement for approximately nine years. Three of those years have been with St. John's County Sheriff's Office. All right. And what other agencies have you worked for? I've worked for the Naval Criminal Investigative Service as a special agent. Worked for St. Augustine Beach Police Department and Brevard County Sheriff's Office. All right. And what is your current, uh, and before I ask that question, let me go back. How many years total in law enforcement? Approximately nine. 
Um, Detective Thompson, what is your what are your current assignment, your duties and responsibilities with the Sheriff's Office? Uh, my current assignment, I'm with the Special Investigations Unit as a detective. All right. And uh, were you working for the St. John's County Sheriff's Office in May of 2021? Yes, sir. What was your role back then? I was a major crimes detective. All right. At some point in time, specifically on May the 9th of 2021, did you become involved in investigation into what began as a disappearance of a young female by the name of Tristan Bailey, later became a homicide investigation. Did you become involved in that investigation? Yes, sir. Um, you called approximately what time of the day it was that you were either called to assist? Approximately because, 5 p.m. And uh, what was sort of the first thing that you were instructed to do? Um, to respond to the Durban Neighborhood Amenity Center, uh, which was being utilized as a uh, primary staging location All right do um, you recall approximately what time it was that you responded uh, around 5 p.m. All right um, and did you get some type of briefing as to basically what was going on and what was known at that particular point in time yes sir and uh, what was going on at the time um, the initial brief was a missing person All right. um, at some point in time were you um, directed to go in a, uh, and help you know, secure a, a residence yes sir and approximately what time was that? Approximately 6 p.m. Shortly thereafter, 6.40 maybe. And what residence was that? Aiden Fuji's residence. Um, how long were you there at that particular location? Approximately an hour, maybe a little bit more than an hour. Okay. And what were you, were you given some instructions following that? Um, there were two patrol deputies that were also present and I instructed them to secure the scene with a crime scene tape. Okay, and what was your next assignment? After that, I was relieved by another major crimes detective, and I was uh, requested to respond to the St. John's County Sheriff's Office Criminal Investigations Division, uh, where I would then meet with Aiden Fuji. Okay, and you, so you were going there to make an effort to interview him, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, did you receive any information um, while you were en route to um, the Sheriff's Office to attempt to conduct that interview? We received information that uh, he had uh, legal representation and to not attempt to interview at that time. Right. Um, when you arrived there um, at the scene, um, was um, Aiden Fucci present? Yes. And where was he? Um, I believe we may have arrived before him, um, and then we walked him into the interview room, or the patrol deputy did. Okay. Um, was he allowed to, to visit with anyone while he was there? Yes, his, uh, his mother and biological father um, were allowed to be in the interview room with him. All right. And um, during the course of, of, that, of their being in that room, um, was the room that they were in equipped with a, a video um, recording device that captured both video and audio? Yes, sir. And was um, their time in that room um, recorded? Yes, sir. And did it capture a conversation between the defendant, Aiden Fucci, and his parents? Yes. Let me approach the witness, Your Honor. No objection. No objection. Uh, we received a state's exhibit. What are we at? Eight? eight yeah. Number eight. And uh, that also not only includes the video, but also the What's this 
It's a holding room. Hmm. It's a holding room. Have you been asking questions? Um, well, they asked, like, what color is my hair and what color my eyes and all that. And that's all I am. And then where we lived. You know, they found this girl, right? Where? In our neighborhood. Down on Main Street. Is she good? No, no she's not. she's dead. That's why this is very important. It's all in you right now. That is my problem. He was the last one seen with her. So right now, it's a lot of it's facing you right now, son. So however you talk, you breathe, you think, then you respond. This is very serious, Aiden. You can't act like I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know. You can't. And you can't. You say understand this is serious. Sure. Clearly, you understand, right? Mm -hmm. Everything you say will affect you. Mm -hmm. That uh, Snapchat that you did was not very smart. Not at all. Now we have people in the burner house, not in our cars, now. Because of that Snapchat thing you did. It's all over. You're all over the internet and everywhere. It social is, media. It is on social media. You'll probably come stay with me after we get done with this. Just for your well safe being. No scripts or nothing like that, right? No, sir. You sure you don't smell? See where she went. Mm. <sighs> what were you doing on the outside? <clears throat> Shoes were off on the camera. Pull your shoes off. Get my feet were hurting. And my shoes can be blisters. Did you come home and leave again? Mm -hmm. Did you sneak back out or you just, you're still at Trey's house all day? Was it Trey's house? Okay. It's just a one night I didn't ask where you were. So it's one night. This is a 
joke. This is your whole life. Your whole life. And hers. And ours. And your brothers and sisters. I know for the kids, that's horrible. Why? Because the kids will hurt me.
Did you see this twenty year old kid? You didn't get in his car? Mm -hmm. I've never even saw him before. Mm -hmm. I just heard about him. That night? Mm -hmm. You just heard about him that night? I don't know, I've heard about him many times. Do you have the black car? I don't know. Are you not scared? Not really. Not really? I'm a little scared, but... If he didn't do nothing, I'd be worried about him. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Did he do nothing right? Can I It's a hell of a bad time, bad spot. Leaving a 13 year old girl by herself in the middle of the streets at 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever time is not smart, bro. Right? Walking home with her in the middle of the night, that wasn't smart either. You stay away from females. Anything could happen. Did you kiss her this night? Mm -hmm. This last night? Mm -hmm. Right, Trey's house? Mm -hmm. Who is your phone? I'm uh, the officer. Did you get your food at least? Mm -hmm. I didn't know what you get you, so I got you a bacon header. Yeah, that was good. Did you ask any questions in South Carolina? Seven two hours to do the autopsy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
in as part of your interviews with different uh, just people associated with Mr. Fucci, did you interview Mr. Ryan Strum? Yes, sir. Okay. And isn't it true that uh, Mr. Strum told you that while he knew Aiden Fucci, he never saw him threaten anyone or do any stabbing movements? I believe that's correct. Okay. And did you effectuate the arrest on Mr. Fucci? Did I? Is that what you asked? Right. Or did you observe it? Were you uh, there for it? Yes, sir. And, and uh, it's true he wasn't combative during the arrest. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. May this witness be excused. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You're free to go. <clears throat> it's uh, 12 o'clock. Is this a good stopping point? Let's go ahead and take a break for uh, lunch. We'll uh, reconvene at uh, one fifteen. If the attorneys could be here by one ten, so that we can get started right at one fifteen. We're in recess.
St. John's County Circuit Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Smith presiding. <clears throat> Could all be seated. Thank you. All right, we're back on the record in case 21 CF 825. We will continue our sentencing hearing. Both sides are present. State, you may now call your next witness. Governor, before we do that, just one thing I just wanted to bring to the court's sure. attention. This will be the medical examiner. Okay. A majority of the family um, and well-wishers are not here. So if we could just, we're going to try to communicate towards the end, but if they're not all back in the courtroom, I know it's a lot of people, so we may just break. You know, or just sit by while we um, get the family in here for the next witness after the medical exam. All right. And any of those that are remaining inside the courtroom, have you uh, cautioned them about the material that will be covered? Uh, we have. Um, they know they can't, you know, see the photos. Um, we've cautioned them, and they know they can leave at any point. All right. Any other matters? Yes, Mr. Yeah, there was one thing, Judge. Um, obviously, we have the hard copy photos that we'll be moving to place in evidence. I've talked with Ms. Peoples about any potential objections to sort of save the time of the foundation questions. As I understand, she has no foundation objections, but I think she wants to renew any objections um, based on the previous hearing. So. Okay, Ms. Peoples? Yes, Your Honor. We would renew all previous objections subject to the motion in limine uh, regarding the autopsy photos and rely on the argument and the agreement at that time, meaning I have had an opportunity to compare uh, the photos that we had reached in the court's ruling on during that hearing. So we understand that they're admitting these photos and we're relying on the arguments and all the objections that we had laid in the earlier hearing. That uh, hearing, I believe, was in uh, reference to the trial, though, correct? As far as the jurors seeing that, uh, and, uh, frankly, the court has already, I would assume, seen all of these photos. But um, we'll take those objections up uh, as we proceed. Thank you. All right. State calls Dr. James Fulcher. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may I? Yes. Position yourself wherever you need to. And just for the record, the uh, photos that are going to be shown in open court are on a video screen that is not viewable to anyone inside the courtroom with the exception of myself, the court reporter, the clerks, <coughs> and counsel. Sir, you can come forward and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. All right, sir, if you'll come on up and have a seat in the witness stand, please. I'll reposition myself here. You may. Good afternoon, sir. Could you uh, say your name for us? Dr. James William Fulcher. How are you, employed, sir? I'm the chief medical examiner for Volusia County, Florida. Uh, four years. <laughs> so we used to cover Seminole and Volusia. Now we just cover Volusia. Um, how long have you been working as a medical examiner in general? Fifteen years. And where did you work at prior to becoming the chief medical examiner of Volusia County? Sure. I did my fellowship in Richmond, Virginia, at the chief medical examiner's office there. My medical school training there as well. And then I served as the chief deputy medical examiner for 10 years in Greenville County, South Carolina, prior to coming to Volusia County. And are you board licensed in any field? Yes, I'm board certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and forensic pathology. I have no failures on my record. Dr. Fulcher, approximately how many autopsies have you conducted in your career? Approximately 4,200. Several hundred times. Uh, within the last year, were you asked to review uh, records pertaining to an autopsy that was performed here in St. Augustine by the medical examiner's office here um, pertaining to a young female by the name of Tristan Bailey? I was, yes, sir. And um, did you um, review a PowerPoint presentation that relates to information from, those, from the autopsy records that you reviewed? Yes, sir. And did that um, presentation? 
relevant to that autopsy? Yes, sir. Ron, I believe there's a foundation objection. Uh, so at this time, I'd offer a safety to the I into evidence. Response? No objection. All right, that'll be received into evidence as stated in the number of exhibits. Yeah, published states nine or UA. Uh, Dr. Walter, uh, when did the autopsy of Tristan Bailey take place? The autopsy took place 5 10 2021 at 9.30 hours at the Office of the Medical Examiner in St. John's County. And who performed that autopsy? Dr. Bulick. And as I think all of us know here, Dr. You were asked to review this because Dr. Bulick passed away last year, right? Yes, Dr. Bulick died in the summer, and my office took over some uh, autopsy responsibilities and also testimony responsibilities for his cases. Um, can you tell us um, what materials did you review in the case? I reviewed autopsy photos, x-rays, a medical examiner's report, the investigator report of the medical examiner, and then the actual autopsy report itself. And after reviewing those materials, were you able to reach your own independent conclusions concerning the cause, manner, and um, of Tristan Bailey's death? Yes. What was your understanding of how old Tristan Bailey was at the time of her death? 13 years of age. In your review of the, um, of the records and photos, did you observe any injuries to the body of Tristan Bailey at the time of her autopsy? Yes, there are significant injuries to the body of uh, Mrs. Bailey. We have 114 separate sharp force injuries a combination of incised and stab wounds overlying many body surface areas. And were those, um, were those sharp force injuries um, identified in autopsy reports as sort of being um, categorized in certain locations of her body? Yes, the autopsy report is very well organized and uh, discrete areas of injury are noted and well documented photographically. In terms of her head and neck area, how many wounds did uh, Tristan Bailey suffer? There are 35 wounds, stab <laughs> wounds and incised wounds, to the total of the head and neck region. Right. Were there any um, objects that were removed from her body in that area at the time of her autopsy? Yes, there was a triangular gray metal fragment removed from uh, the scalp underlying one of the wounds. And in terms of her, um, her upper back and shoulder areas, There are 14 on the upper back and shoulders, 12 on the mid back, and then three to the right lower back, right flank. Um, where's there evidence that Tristan Bailey had um, suffered defensive injuries? Yes, there is. And how many and where were those injuries located? Uh, largely on the right arm and hand, 22 on the back of the right hand, wrist and forearm, 17 on the front of the right arm, and then 10 on the left arm, scattered more on the left. And why are those, um, those types of injuries referred to by yourself and other um, pathologists as um, defensive injuries? They're commonly seen in individuals as they're being stabbed or injured in an attempt to ward off the blade, protecting their torso, main body core, with an extremity. Go to the next um, photograph here, Dr. Fulcher, uh, which is um, State's Exhibit. <coughs> States Exhibit 9A, can you tell us what we're looking at in this photograph? This is a slide of the body bag with a uniquely numbered red tag through the double zippers securing the body as it was transported. This will be cut as soon as we, the medical examiner gets in the building, obviously, in the autopsy suite. And I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, um, but, and just really just to kind of show the court um, as it makes its decision, sort of types of injuries that Ms. Um, Bailey had suffered in what location? Yes, sir. Um, um, slide B, C, and D. Can you tell us what those photos represent? Those are overall photos as the body is cleaned. It's lying on the stainless table. The body's been largely washed. There's a bit of debris in the hair, but largely that body is, uh, as it's presented, cleaned up a little bit. 
and then we have multiple stab wounds, which are best illustrated in additional up close photographs. Those are abrasions to the anterior surfaces of the knees and contusions as well. Now moving here, so we've discussed generally the head and neck injuries. Um, can you, um, going here to states 9G, can you tell us what we're looking at in that photograph? Yes, this is the right side of the head. The head has been shaved to best show the injuries. That is, all hair is removed from the scalp. And we have a conglomeration of 11 injuries, numbers, and every injury is numbered, every stab wound and incised wound is numbered. Numbers 23 to 33. And were there um, any associated injuries to the skull area, Tristan Bailey, underneath the ones that are obvious here? Yes. Uh, some of the larger incised wounds show incised scored marks on the bone, on the outer table of the skull. And we also have chipped out lesions of the uh, posterior vertex or the back of the head as the tip of the knife impacts the skull. Those are best illustrated in other photos though. Uh, Says 9H, what is what we're looking at here? 9H is a up close photo of wound numbered 31, which is one of the longer incised wounds. It shows a fishtail appearance at the posterior aspect indicating to me that the blade was inserted in the skin and then twisted or repositioned at the posterior aspect of that wound, giving that appearance. And that would be it, sort of looking at the way we're looking at the bottom of that photograph? Yes, uh, if the uh, court looks at wound number 32, the fishtail is directly above that right there. Yes, sir, that's it. It's just a pattern of injury because it looks like a fishtail. Moving to states 9i, um, what is this, where is this located, and um, how many injuries, what, what type of injuries and how many are there? Sure. This is the grouping of 10 stab and incised wounds behind and above the right ear. These are numbered 82, I'm sorry, 72 to 81 in the autopsy report. The more short wounds are stab wounds, and the longer wounds, for example, wound 74, are incised wounds. Definitionally, that means the wound is longer than it is deep to be an incised wound, deeper than it is long to be a stab wound. So because there were so many wounds on this area, the original pathologist was unable to fit enough numbered placards in the picture, so they removed all the placards and then repositioned an additional two placards to show the additional injuries. In the first photograph, all the other placards covered up these wounds. Correct. Separate photographs so you can see. Correct. They needed two photos to show all the wounds in this particular site. You mean here to say nine. Jay, what section of the body this? This is scalp and neck. We have nine wounds, numbers 82 to 90. Right. We see eight, this goes up to 85, so A and L, those include the other stab or incised wounds? Yes, these are all stab wounds to the scalp and back of neck. A total of nine, 82 to 90 on the back and neck scalp. The reason three photographs were taken is because they're presented across the neck laterally and then medially, so different angles were used to best illustrate them. Moving here to states 9M. Yes. What is this? This is the back of the scalp. It shows multiple wounds, but of interest, wound number 34, which also has a fishtail appearance and has a portion of rounded protruded fat through an additional, or adipose tissue, through an additional associated injury. 
All right, and I'm going to take you through. And there were the, the the slide indicates a total of five ones. Those are not all pictured in this one photograph. Is that correct? They are not because of the curvature of the head. Multiple photographs are required to document all wounds appropriately. Going to nine in. This will be one more of those five. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so we have 34 as a stab wound and 36 is going to be an incised wound because it is longer than it is deep. Stage nine, oh. 38, now we're on the far left hand side of the head and we have an additional incised wound on the scalp. Stage nine, P. This is essentially the same photograph we saw before. Yes, 34 is, uh, corresponds to one of the chipped out regions of bone. <coughs> We're looking under 34, lateral and slightly medial, and we see the prosector, Dr. Bulick, holding, uh, most likely him, him or an autopsy tech, holding plastic forceps, removing a triangular fragment of metal that's deeply embedded into the tissues of the scalp, adjacent to wound 34. And did that show up in an x-ray? It did, yes, sir. Nine, the 9R nine is just simply a picture of the fragment after it's been removed. Yes, yeah, a photograph with scale of the fragment. The 9S. 9S is the anti-mortem before, I'm sorry, post-mortem before the body is cleaned up. Photograph, you can see uh, jewelry and whatnot on the neck, but it also shows the triangular fragment embedded in the scalp at the back of the skull and braces. So to go back to space 9D. Mm-hmm. Where exactly was the metal? metal fragment is located approximately a centimeter and a half to two centimeters medial towards midline, so towards <laughs> the one centimeter, yeah, right above like, go above the one, right there, there you go, that's about it. If one looks at that photo, they can see the punched out portion of fat uh, in Q as it's reflected down, the fat is directly adjacent to the, um, the incised wound that was made by the autopsy technician when they reflected the scalp back to get that fragment. That helps her orientation. So states 9T, U, and V. What are these photographs of? T shows the scalp. Uh, as the skin is reflected, we have incised wounds to the right aspect across the frontal and parietal bone. That corresponds to that longer wound that we saw previously. And then importantly, we have two chipped out lesions, one at the top of the head uh, near midline and then one on midline posteriorly. Uh, the one on midline posteriorly corresponds to 34 and that's where the fragment was found at or near that area. Those are also incised score lines. Some of those incised wounds are deep to the scalp and uh, the skull, actually scoring the skull. U shows a punched out lesion uh, or injury to the right, uh, I'm sorry, the left uh, frontal bone. And uh, that wound penetrates into the skull and actually pierces the inner table of the skull slightly. Yes, in V, we're looking at the inside of the skull cap as it's removed, and we see the punched out lesion. How much is, does it take quite a bit of force to be able to do that? Yes, it's a significant amount of force to uh, <laughs> drive a knife through a, a skull. Yes, but, yes, sir. <coughs> Moving to the upper back and shoulders, starting with the overall back. Um, that we see here in states 9W. Yes, W is an overall picture of the back and shoulders. <clears throat> now for the upper back and shoulders, um, moving here to states 9X, what section of the body, what type of injuries are these and how many? So we're looking at the left shoulder. Uh, one is looking at the top of the shoulder. We have five wounds, number numbers 39 to 43. I'm sorry, we have six. 
it might be five in that picture, there's a total of six on the autopsy report, 39 to uh, 43. Why. Oh, and he has a, he, I know why, he has an additional one, uh, 30, uh, 93, that's in that group that's not seen in that picture. My apologies. Uh, say it's nine, why? Uh, here we're on the right shoulder again. We have wounds numbers 95 and 98. Uh, they're located uh, 95 more medial towards the neck and 98 is more lateral on the shoulder. So those were not well illustrated in the previous photograph. And then 9Z? 9Z is the upper back going tor towards midline or the posterior neck. We have four stab wounds, 92, 96, 97, 99, and then two incised wounds, 91 and 94. So that's a total of six? Yes, sir. Sharp force injuries? Sharp force injuries, yes, sir. Six sharp force injuries, four stab wounds, two incised wounds. And I want to talk about the middle back, so moving to states nine double A. How many injuries here, what type? On the mid-back, we have a cluster of six stab wounds, numbers 103 to 108. The picture is taken oriented from the posterior left side looking towards the midline of the back. All stab wounds. Did any of these um, actually penetrate into the chest cavity? Yes, three do. Stab wounds 103, mm -hmm. 106, and 108 penetrate into the chest cavity on the left side. You see 106 here, the circle? Yes, that penetrates into the chest cavity. Moving to states 9 double B. How many injuries do we see here on what type? Uh, double B is a picture of the mid-back. We have stab wound 108, which penetrates into the chest cavity. And we have the additional wounds, 106, 104, 96, 94, 92, 103, an additional unlabeled wound that's out of the field on the bottom. This is to the right side of the back. Wounds that penetrate into the chest cavity include 106 and 108, which are both shown here, and 103. And um, you say they, the, um, 106, 103, 108 all entered the, the chest cavity. What was what type of um, effect did I have? Were these fatal ones? Uh, yes, I'll take them one by one if that's okay. Yes, sir. 103 enters the chest cavity, passes uh, through the cartilage of the fourth left costovertebra joint, uh, and uh, it injures the uh, that tissue and causes a pneumothorax. That particular wound does not penetrate into lung. Its approximate depth is two inches. 106 uh, penetrates through uh, the chest wall between the posterior third and fourth ribs. It enters the pleural cavity, does not penetrate into the lung. It does cause, of course, pneumohemothorax, uh, and its total depth is approximately six centimeters. 108 penetrates into the back, penetrates between the fourth and fifth posterior ribs, and penetrates into the left upper lung lobe. This wound is longer. It is at least four inches in length. So that's 108 penetrating the lung, 103, 106 just penetrating the chest cavity. You used the, the phrase uh, pneumothorax or pneumothorax. What is, <clears throat> what is that? So when the chest cavity is penetrated, the normal occurring negative pressure that adheres the outside surface of the lung to the, the inside surface of the chest is lost. Air rushes into the chest cavity. So presumably uh, the lung collapses and uh, presumably that's why 103 and 106 do not penetrate into the uh, lung because it's already started to collapse. There's an air space there at that point. And, and in terms of when that type of injury and that it begins to have that effect, um, how does that cause death and uh, how long does it take before the person dies? Sure. There is, of course, blood loss with any penetrating wound to the lungs, but the collapsing of the bilateral lungs in this case would cause a death by inability to breathe or suffocation, essentially, without uh, the negative pressure 
in the chest cavity, allowing the diaphragm and the chest to work appropriately. The lungs cannot expand and draw in air. How long would it take for death to occur? Minutes. This would not be an instantaneous death? No, sir. Going here, state nine, double C, what do we see here? Double C is an internal photograph. Here we have the left lung, note it has two lobes, and the left upper lung lobe has a large horizontally oriented uh, incised wound, stab wound, actually it's a stab wound, uh, part of the stab wound. Uh, looking carefully at the superior surface of this wound, we can see there's significant pleural hemorrhage. That is to say that the tissue of the lung was perfused with blood. There was a heartbeat when this occurred because we have deep soft tissue hemorrhage in the lung itself. Yes, the hemorrhagic appearance confirms that. Moving here, state nine, the, uh, DD. Is DD is the right side of the back. Uh, this is stab wound 100, and it is reapproximated by hands uh, and the numbers there. And then, importantly, on this wound, we see a hilt mark or a handle mark. There's a rectilinear abrasion to the right hand side. That represents the handle of the knife. Stab wound 100, it also penetrates into the chest cavity and the lung. And how deep was that wound? That wound measures four inches in depth. It penetrates through the third uh, intercostal space, penetrates into the right upper lobe or the right, or the upper lobe of the right lung and uh, creates an injury in the lung, also creating blood in that chest cavity and pneumothorax as well. When you talk about the evidence of the knife on the handle <clears throat> mark, yes. that would be an indication that the, the blade of the knife was pushed all the way through the body and the handle actually made an abrasion on the skin. Yes, the knife of the blade is completely inserted in picture or in wound 100. Moving to state nine, double E. What injuries do we see here? We have uh, 102 and 103, and uh, I believe the remaining wounds are outside the kind of on the periphery. But the main purpose of this picture is to show 102 and 103. This is the um, hold on right side of the back. <coughs> Yes, right side of the back. And how deep did this one go? The one, and when I say one or two, I guess I should specify. Yes, one or two is uh, 10 centimeters deep, approximately a little over uh, four inches. And we have wounding there into the <coughs> fourth intercostal space, the right upper lung lobe. This wound also shows a hilt mark the same uh, handle mark. It's right here. Yes, sir. There's a rectilinear abrasion at the tip of the stab wound corresponding to the handle. Is this a fatal wound? Yes. Uh, 102 penetrates uh, deeply into the right upper lung lobe, causing hemorrhage and pneumothorax as well. Going to states 9 double F, what, what part of the body is this? So here we're on the right side of the back. We have 109, 110, and 111. 109 is a gaping stab wound, uh, and it does pass into the lung. 110 is a more superficial incised wound. And then 111, as I recall, is deep to soft tissue. And what did uh, wound 109, what did it so wound 109 penetrates between the seventh and eighth ribs and goes into the lower lobe of the right lung. The previous stab wounds went into the upper lobe, also causing hemorrhage and pneumothorax. <clears throat> and going to stage 9, what is, what is this looking at? We're looking at the right side of the body, showing the penetration of uh, the wounds 109 and 102. 
inside of the body cavity, really the home. Basically, these are the saplings from the other side. Correct. The organs have been removed, and we're looking at the pleural surface with the ribs and the intercostal muscles, the muscles between the ribs showing the stab wounds. Uh, importantly here on double G, the wound closest to midline does show subpleural hemorrhage, indicating that the body was uh, perfused at the time. That blood should not be there, uh, of course, if it, was, if it has to be perfused. There has to be a heartbeat and a blood pressure for that blood to get there. 9 double H. This is the right lung. We're looking at the two stab wounds to the upper lobe from the top, really. This is like an apex down look at the lung. All right, so going to the section of photos of the right lower back and flank. Yes. Moving to states 9 double I. Um, again, what section of the body is the county in your reasonable type? We have three stab wounds. Uh, numbered 112 to 114. They are approximately deep to fat subcutaneous tissue, a depth of about an inch, two to three centimeters. There's hemorrhage involved and associated with these wounds. None of these are fatal. I'm going to what you described as defensive injuries before the state's nine double J. Um, you indicated before there were a total of only 49 defensive injuries, is that right? Total all over both arms, yes. Is that what we see? States 9 double J, double K, double L. I'll come back to these in a minute. Double M, double N, double O. Yes, sir. So, that's a nine. nine penetrates the full thickness of the right hand and has a corresponding exit wound. So this wound nine, which is basically on the portion of the thumb here, penetrates through and pierces the palm. It's a through and through wound. And then again, nine double L, these, um, there's a number of Wounds two and three enter on the posterior aspect of the right hand, I'm sorry, the right hand passing between the bones of the hand and exiting the palm. So they're also through and through stab wounds of the hand. What would that indicate to you, the fact that apparently a knife or a sharp object penetrated the hand and went all the way through? Uh, obviously there's a certain amount of force that's required to penetrate a human hand, uh, but it also is a fairly classic defensive injury to have full penetration of a hand by, by stab wound. Would it indicate in any way that the hand was um, against some type of hard or solid object? Uh, certainly could be. Uh, normally uh, we see these, uh, the, the decedent will place the hand between the assailant and their body. So the directionality here is from the back of the hand to the front, presumably the hand is between the central core of the body, which humans reflexively protect, and that's why we have the stab wound going that direction. Uh, states nine double P. Um, this is the right right arm. Is that correct? Yes, right wrist and forearm. Twelve wounds. Numbers fifty-five to sixty-one. We're looking at the palmar surface with multiple stab wounds in the palm, and then additional sharp force injuries, uh, mostly stab wounds on the right wrist and forearm. And in this particular photograph, you can actually see the other side of those injuries that went all the way yep. to the right. Yep, that's correct. Nine double Q, we have uh, additional injuries. Uh, we've seen photographs of many of these, but we have 62 and 64, which are on the right arm. Nine double R. 
Uh, yes, uh, because the wounds basically go from the palm, well, the back of the hand, all the way down to the elbow, and there's a large number of them on multiple surfaces, multiple photographs must be taken to capture them all. And same for double, nine double S. Yes, here we're seeing wounds 69 to 71. Uh, 70 and 71 are superficial incised wounds, where the others are uh, stab wounds, much like we've seen before. Soft tissue wounding. All right. And then there were also sharp wound injuries to the left arm, is that correct? Correct. Here we have illustrated on the upper left arm wounds 45 and 46. State 9W. These are the uh, wounds to the left forearm, eight wounds. Uh, the ones illustrated in this photo are 47, 48, 50, 52, and 54. Uh, one can see there are fewer stab wounds on the left arm than the right. And space 9, double B. This is 49, which is uh, the only wound uh, on this side of the arm. So it has a separate photo. 9, double, uh, 9 WW. WW shows a gaping uh, incised wound of the lateral aspect of the arm on the ulnar surface extending across the wrist on a horizontal plane. That's nearby the wound we previously described. That's wound 53. It's a uh, stab wound, superficial wounding there. Dr. Pochi indicated that the end defensive injuries indicated that um, she was warding off these stabs. Um, would that be evidence that um, Tristan Bailey, would that be consistent with her conscious uh, aware of her attack and fighting for her life? Yes. Would these injuries have been painful? Yes. No further questions. Hello. Hello, ma'am. I don't have a, a lot of questions for you today. Right? No problem. In terms of the fact that you took over this case and you were not the original medical examiner. That is correct. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Bulick actually did the report. Yes, ma'am. And you did not have the opportunity to review that report. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Bulick actually did the report. Yes. You reviewed the report and you reviewed the photos. Yes, ma'am. Um, and you were not present on May 10th for the actual autopsy? No, ma'am, I was not. You did not go to the scene? No, ma'am. And you weren't involved with the actual collection of, for example, any um, DNA or the fragment? No, ma'am, I was not. So in terms of the blood loss, is it fair to say that on view, we didn't look at all of the organs, but on view of the paleness of the kidneys, that there's a lot of blood loss? Yes, and the lungs. We do have a picture of the lungs. Uh, they're quite pale. And so, same with the liver, same with the lungs, that there's a significant amount of blood loss. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and I understand that you've indicated that the heart was still beating at the time of these injuries. Yes, the, the hemorrhagic appearance of the stab wounds to the lungs certainly requires uh, a heartbeat at the time. So yes, we would not have the hemorrhagic appearance of the stab wounds. These are anti-mortem injuries to the lungs. And with that in mind then, because you're seeing significant blood loss, is it also fair to say with this large amount of blood loss that there's loss of consciousness? There can be, but it, it would not be instant for sure. Right. It, versus, for example, the single gunshot wound to the head. There's certain gunshot wounds that are instant. Of course, yes. This but when is you're, not instant. Right. But when you're seeing this much blood loss, it would lead to loss of consciousness also. Yes, so eventually, yes ma'am. Even though the heart's still beating. Uh, yes, you would lose consciousness most likely bef uh, before uh, cessation of heartbeat, yes. And then in terms of the, I'm going to try this word, pneumothorax. Pneumothorax. Right, there were two of them. Yes, both sides, On both right sides. and left. Go ahead. I'm just going to say they would have collapsed the lungs. And that would lead to loss of life? Yes. All right, and is it fair to say because you have both of these pneumothorax, meaning one on each lung, that this collection or even the cluster of injuries would promote the loss of life in a faster time space? Uh, faster, but certainly still not instantaneous. 
Right, again, the distinction being the, the gunshot wound to the head. Right. All right. So in this particular instance, then, is it fair to say that you didn't see any healing of any of these injuries? Oh, no, none of these injuries would have been healing, no. Right, so this, didn't, this isn't a, a type of, um, this 114 didn't take a course of hours or days. Oh, no, this all happens relatively quickly. Yes, ma'am. All wounds on the body show a appearance that is acute. There's no healing at, at any 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 wound anywhere on the body. Thank you very much, Dr. Neal. Free to go. You want to take a break now for we'll just take a 10 minute recess and let you if you can uh, remove that TV as well.
Say, Judge, kind of sir, call and I return to order. You can all be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, state. Back on the record, you may call your next witness. State calls Dr. Gregory Pritchard. Dr. Pritchard. Sir, if you'll pause right there and raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Sir, if you'll come up and have a seat in the witness stand. Thank you, Lord. State your witness. Thank you. Good afternoon, Doctor. If you would, uh, introduce yourself to the court and let the court know how you're employed. My name is Greg Pritchard. Last name is P-R-I-C-H-A-R-D, and I'm a licensed psychologist in the state of Florida. How long have you been a licensed psychologist in the state of Florida? Uh, this is my 27th year. And what is your educational background? I graduated from the University of Florida in 1989 with a bachelor's degree in clinical psychology. I received my master's degree in clinical psychology from Forest Institute of Professional Psychology in 1992. Uh, I completed my academic work at Forest Institute for my doctorate degree and part of that is Part of getting your doctorate degree requires that you do an internship, which I did at Florida State Hospital in 1993-1994. Upon completion of the internship, I graduated with my doctorate degree, magna cum laude, with a specialization in assessment and diagnostics in 1994 and subsequently licensed in the state of Florida in 1996. And after your internship and you were licensed, just kind of walk through generally your areas of employment since that time. Um, after my internship that I completed in 1994, I was retained by the hospital, Florida State Hospital. Uh, I worked there for seven years on several, several different units there. The first unit was a dual diagnosis unit. It was a unit for individuals who were intellectually disabled and mentally ill. I then worked at a civil admission unit where individuals are committed for long-term care to Florida State Hospital on the civil side. In other words, absence of any criminal allegations against them. And then I worked at a forensic admission unit at the hospital where the state's uh, adults who have criminal charges and they're either incompetent to proceed or they're not guilty by reason of insanity and they require hospitalization. Um, my duty was essentially to uh, make an effort to, to rehabilitate them and return them to the community. And that was a seven year span, 1994 to 2001. During that span, I had a one day a week private practice where I did forensic evaluations in the community. So competency assessments, sanity assessments, violence risk assessments, sexual predator evaluations under the state sexual predator act. So all forensic related evaluations. And then in 2001, I resigned from the hospital and have been in full time forensic private practice since then. And you mentioned a number of evaluations that you conduct. Um, when you do that, um, since you've been in private practice moving forward, are you often hired by both the state and uh, defendants? I am, yes. Okay. And how, have you done thousands of evaluations, Dr. Pritchard? Thousands of evaluations, yes. I would say by this point more than 10,000 forensic evaluations. Okay. Do a number of your evaluations include criminal defendants charged with a various amounts of um, violent crimes? Yes, that is a very regular part of my practice. And what about evaluating juveniles? Do you do that as well? I've done that my entire career. In fact, before I got my doctorate degree, I worked on a juvenile uh, uh, psychiatric facility. That's where I started with juveniles. Um, since I've been licensed, I have had a contract with Apalachicola Forest Youth Camp, which is, it's the state's facility where juveniles who are considered incompetent to proceed in the criminal realm 
they are committed to Apalachicola Forest Youth Camp. It's 17 miles from my house. I've been contracted with them for about 15 years. I also regularly do uh, juvenile competency evaluations, primarily in the Second Circuit, Leon County, and the First Circuit, uh, Escambia County, Pensacola, um, those two circuits, but also others throughout the state. I also evaluate juveniles uh, for sex offender recidivism risk, so uh, sex offender juvenile evaluations. Um, I also do evaluations of juvenile sentencing. So under the juvenile sentencing laws that came out between 2010, 2012, uh, things that need to be attended to when sentencing juveniles. So I've done dozens of those under those juvenile sentencing laws. And what you're referring to there is what's commonly known in our field as the Miller-Graham decisions and then the, the rules essentially in Florida that came about in the statutes and all the factors that courts are to consider when sentencing juveniles. Is that That's what you're correct. referring to? Yes. And you've testified in Miller-Graham uh, sentencings or resentencings of juveniles since those laws have changed? Many, yes. Okay. In reference to State of Florida versus Aiden Fucci, what were you asked to do in this case? I was asked to do an evaluation of Mr. Fucci uh, for sentencing purposes. So under the juvenile sentencing laws, um, there's one juvenile sentencing law, 921.1401 of Florida statutes, that specifically addresses things that should be considered when sentencing juvenile for capital murder cases. So I was asked to evaluate Mr. Fucci and uh, compile a report based on the variables outlined in that statute. Now, were you ultimately permitted to um, have a face-to-face -face evaluation with Mr. Fucci? I was not permitted to see Mr. Fucci. Okay. What um, categories of records, and we'll go through those, um, did you review in this case prior to forming your opinions? Well, I reviewed the St. Count, uh, John's County Sheriff's Office investigative re reports re uh, regarding the investigation into the uh, disappearance and subsequent uh, murder of Tristan Bailey. Um, I reviewed the medic medical examiner's autopsy report as well as the autopsy photos. I reviewed uh, transcripts from Mr. Fucci's girlfriend at the time, Zofi Bowman. There were four separate transcripts that I reviewed from her. I watched audio and video of three separate interviews of Mr. Fucci's best friend, uh, Dolphus Ab Absher. He goes by Trey, so I'll refer to him as Trey if that's okay. Um, I also reviewed a number of school records spanning Mr. Fucci's educational career. I reviewed pictures of the photos that were located in Mr. Fucci's uh, room that have already been referenced. I reviewed a Snapchat folder that contained the Snapchat uh, videos and texts that were sent by Mr. Fucci when he was in the back of the police car. I reviewed uh, audio interviews of approximately 10 teachers that had familiarity with Mr. Fucci at Patriot Oaks Academy, where he was attending school as, where, as well as his previous school. Um, I listened to audio of Tristan Bailey's parents, Forrest and Stacy Bailey, prior to Tristan Bailey being located. Um, I reviewed an audio of a cousin. Uh, I have her initials here. It's, uh, I believe, Hannah Cunningham, as well as a deposition of Hannah Cunningham. I had deposition transcripts of probation officer Dwayne Barton, who has had some association with Mr. Fucci at the Duval County Jail. Uh, Sergeant William Cox, who is from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, who works at the jail. Uh, 
information. It was a deposition transcription from an ESE teacher that Mr. Fucci had, uh, Alyssa Gates. I had uh, deposition transcripts of brother Dylan Hicks, um, not listed in my report, which I reviewed after I submitted my report, is a deposition transcript of brother Preston Fucci, also a deposition transcript of friend Michaela Harris. Um, I had a couple of Jacksonville Sheriff's Office incident reports that were written about Mr. Fucci since he's been at the Duval County Jail, one in January of 2022, one in October of 2022. I reviewed uh, videos of Mr. Fucci in a court appearance, one on September 1st of 2021, one on September 8th of 2021, and then a letter and an audio interview of an adult inmate at the Duval County Jail with the initials AS. Okay. Based on that volume of records you just outlined and everything that you reviewed in this case, photographs, um, was that information sufficient for you to form opinions in your area of clinical psychology as it relates to the factors that the courts to consider in this juvenile sentencing? Yes, I believe so. Um, there is a lot of records, and uh, one central aspect of any forensic evaluation is the records that we have uh, about the individual that we're, we're, we're evaluating. Now, there's a limitation. Um, I'm obligated to express this, there's a limitation that I could not see Aiden Fucci. So that limits my evaluation process a bit, but because of the volume and density of the records I was able to review, a lot of teachers, family members, friends, um, I felt like I had sufficient uh, information to draw a lot of conclusions. Okay, and is this the only case you've ever um, been asked to assess on where a defendant, you haven't had that face-to-face -face or a defendant didn't cooperate with you? No, not at all. It's not uncommon for a uh, individual in the criminal justice system to refuse an evaluation, to refuse to have face-to-face -face contact with a psychologist. So it happens pretty regularly. Okay, and you're confident in this case that based on the records, um, they're sufficient for your opinions that you'll give here today? Yes. Okay. Now I want to move to um, the sentencing factors that the court is to consider. Um, in your report, Dr. Pritchard, you... Your Honor, at this time, defense renews the objection to the motion that was filed regarding Dr. Pritchard's testimony. Let me hear the full question, please. What is your question first? I don't think it was to my... Was it to my question, or...? Just I think I was about to move into opinion, <laughs> so she's just making an objection. All right, let me... Uh, I was about to begin asking him his opinions as relates to the factors we're here to discuss. Based upon your prior arguments, you're renewing your objection. Yes, sir. And that objection is overruled. You may proceed, counsel. Okay, thank you. Doctor, you did a, um, a thorough job and you did address the nature and circumstances of the offense, um, in, which is uh, factor A for the court in your report. Um, the court has heard a lot about that this morning already, as I believe you've been here as well through other witnesses. So I don't need you to recite those again, but just as they're relevant to the other factors, yes, if you'll just bring them up yes, um, as we walk through these. I kind of want to start with factor C in this case. Um, that factor had you analyze and look at the defendant's age, maturity, intellectual capacity, general mental and emotional health at the time of the offense. And so I kind of want to talk, and that's a big, a big section in your report, but I want to go through that um, and see what you were able to glean from the records of importance about uh, Mr. Fucci in those areas at the time. Um, and so we can start with teachers or however you want to start with that. Um, I think just if we will take, take each, each uh, 
you know, descriptor here individually, like age, for example. Okay. Factually, Mr. Fuchu was 14 and a half years old when this incident occurred. Okay. The next uh, uh, descriptor under the C factor is maturity, and maturity is sometimes a difficult thing to assess. In many cases, you will have commentary in the records from, for example, teachers that describe the individual as mature or immature. Um, so what I noted with regard to maturity for Aiden Fucci at the time was that there was in all the records that I reviewed, there was no commentary that Mr. Fucci was immature. Okay, so I thought that was fairly remarkable that nobody's characterizing him as immature for his age. I did see two uh, characterizations of Mr. Fucci being mature. So one of those characterizations came from his juvenile probation officer who has contact with him at the jail, Officer Barton, described him as mature for his age. I also noted that his best friend, Trey, dis when describing Aiden Fucci, described him as more mature than the peers, which is part of the reason that Trey described that he got along well with Mr. Fucci. So those were the only specific references to his maturity status from all of the records that I reviewed. And similarly related to maturity, I think you have some comments noted about um, whether he was like a leader, characterized as a leader or a follower amongst his peers. What right. did you learn That's, about that? Uh, sometimes you kind of glean a maturity level based on whether they're considered leaders in their classrooms or with their peers or conversely followers so obviously when somebody is described as a leader they tend to be more mature than the peers that they're hanging around in, with which is why they are characterized as leaders so i saw two references one from girlfriend zoffy bowman and one from friend michaela harris that they believed and they perceived that Mr. Fucci was the leader when it came to him and his best friend, Trey Absher. Okay. The next sort of descriptor in that factor is intellectual capacity um, or intelligence. What were you able to determine about Mr. Fucci's intelligence based on the records you had? So I think the best place to start in terms of intelligence is this. His intelligence was never formally tested. So there's no school records that indicate he was given a formal uh, Wechsler intelligence scale for children would be the standard one. So there's no indication that he was given one of those in the school environment. Um, but again, though, I didn't see characterizations of Mr. Fucci being unintelligent or having cognitive problems. Okay, when we say cognitive problems, it's, a, it's synonymous with intellectual problems, being not very smart or having cognitive processing or comprehension problems. There was no characterizations of that. The only specific reference I saw to Mr. Uh, Fucci's intelligence came from Sergeant Cox at the uh, Duval County Jail. He described Mr. Fucci as intelligent, but without many street smarts. Okay. And you did also review grades and how he was categorized at school. If you'll describe that and perhaps the difference between academics and what you just discussed as intelligence. Okay, so um, in school, he, he was in special education classes. So he was, he was in ESE, which stands for Exceptional Student Education Classes. Um, his designation under that ESE umbrella, there's a lot of different designations. Some refer to designations because of cognitive or intellectual limitations. Some of them refer to uh, limitations because of academic difficulties, which is separate from cognitive intellectual. It's academic. 
Some of the designations under the ESC umbrella have to do with behavioral issues like emotional handicap. So Mr. Fucci was in special education classes for specific learning disability, uh, acronym SLD. Now what SLD generally means in the school environment is, is the, the student's academic performance is lower than what is expected given his intellectual capacity. So in other words, he's underperforming academically. Okay, so he was in SLD classes and he was recognized as having some academic difficulties. Pretty consistently, he was described in the school environment as struggling academically, okay, in, in specific areas, so specific learning disabilities. So specific for Mr. Fucci was language arts, like reading, and math. Those were, appeared to be his two primary areas of academic uh, academic difficulty so um, you know he had tutors he had he had services in that SLD curricula where he had uh, ESE teachers who would spend individualized time with him um, he still struggled in those areas now there was another indication of academic uh, I would say academic deficiency relative to peers. So there's a Florida uh, standard assessment. It's a standardized academic measure that is given to every student yearly to see where they match up with their peers, their, their same age peers, in terms of academic performance in a number of different subjects. So Mr. Fucci took these standard uh, standard I'm sorry, Florida standard assessment each year, year like all the other students. The scale is basically one to five. Five is the best, that means mastery, whereas one is the worst, which means the, the term they use is inadequate. Uh, Mr. Fucci scored in the one, the inadequate range, pretty consistently in language arts and in math, and at least one time in science, too. So clearly those were some, some specific problems for him in, in the academic environment. And what about his grades? You reference, um, I believe, kind of starting, I think it went back to fourth grade, and then Right. How they go over time. Right. The, the grades uh, were never great. He had some better years and some worse years. It looked like his worst year was likely the sixth grade. Sixth grade, it was, it was a lot of Ds and Fs. Not all Ds and Fs, but a lot of Ds and Fs. Um, however, I noted that in seventh and eighth grade, his grades seemed to get a little better. It seemed like maybe at that time he was getting a little more individualized att attention in the, uh, in the SLD, Exceptional Student Education, uh, context. So his grades in seventh and eighth grades were, uh, you know, a couple of A's, a couple of B's, um, several C's, one D, one F. I think that was seventh grade, and then eighth grade it was similar. So it was kind of all from some A's, at least one F, but I would say in, in average, it was probably C average if you averaged all of the grades. So his grades weren't, um, weren't terrible, they weren't good, they were kind of middle of the road, except worse when he was in the sixth grade and seemed to get better. Now I noted that there was a, uh, it's called an IEP, standing for Individualized Education Plan. These students that are in the ESE curricula, they are given a individualized education plan so they can map out kind of goals for the student. I noted, noted the last one for Mr. Fucci was, was uh, put together in April of 2021, which would have been one month before, uh, before the murder. So. At, at that point in time, he was still on track to receive a standard high school diploma. So sometimes when it's obvious that a child is not going to academically be able to uh, achieve to the point to get a standard high school diploma, 
they will get what's called a special education diploma. In Mr. Fucci's case, his last IEP indicated that he was still on track to receive a standard high school diploma. One other thing that was referenced in that IEP was there's a question on the IEPs, does the child's behavior interfere with his academic achievement or the achievement of other students? So on that last IEP, that question was answered yes. So there was another dimension here with Mr. Fucci, and that dimension is he had some behavioral issues in school as well. And I want to talk about <coughs> their behavior uh, in just a minute, but before we get to that along this line of his ESE and SLD designations, when you reviewed all of the um, information from the teachers, there was a dean in that mix, I believe, a dean of discipline and the teachers, did their descriptions of him and his performance, were they consistent with that descriptor of an academic problem versus the actual cognitive intellectual? And explain that a little bit to the court. Beyond the scope. Beyond the scope of his expertise. Yes, Your Honor, she's asking questions about education, not as a psychologist or anything wrong. Repeat your question, please. Beyond the scope of his expertise. No. I'm asking him if the teachers provided any information to support his opinion that Mr. Fucci had more of an academic problem than a cognitive problem. The objection is overruled. Yes, it, it was fairly consistent from the teacher's perspective. And again, there was no reference to him having cognitive deficits, like Mr. Fucci isn't bright or um, he's struggling cognitively. The consistent characterization by teachers was that he has the ability and the capacity to achieve academically, but his motivation is lacking. So it was that other component was some behavioral issues, <clears throat> excuse me, some lack of motivation, some lack of effort that was also getting in the way of his academic performance. Okay. And before I interrupted there, you were going to move on to the um, behavior and disciplinary issues that could be playing a part in, in these grades and things that you saw, is that right? Right, it kind of goes hand in hand. When we have students who behaviorally, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're getting in a lot of trouble, maybe suspensions, then that can affect their academic progress because they're not always listening to the learning that is provided by the teacher or, um, you know, th these, grades one through all the way through 12th, mm -hmm. each grade builds on the next in terms of skills. So if the student isn't picking it up because their behavior is poor, they're not motivated, then as they progress through school, their academics are usually going to get worse. Okay. So what I noted about Mr. Fucci in terms of his behavior, in the third grade, his behavior was, was characterized as pretty good. So he, he got satisfactory ratings from his teachers in terms of his conduct in essentially every area. <coughs> Excuse me. By fourth grade, there seemed to be some indication that his behavior was getting a, a little worse. So there were some characterizations by teachers that uh, he wasn't always um, motivated to do his best. Uh, he, he wasn't always controlling his conduct. So you saw that a little more in fourth grade. And it seemed to get worse as time went on, which is not unusual. A lot of times with adolescence, with pubescence, when a child gets to be 12, there's hormones and there's different social demands, and sometimes that's when we really see the, the, the bad behavior uh, emerge from a, a child who maybe had demonstrated fairly good behavior before then. Um, so we see that. So I noted that he had between uh, February of 2018, so February of 2018, Mr. Fucci would have been 11 years old. Um, and April of 2021, which again is a month before the murder, and he would have been 14 years old. So in that span of three years, he had 22 disciplinary referrals. 
Okay, so, so that's a fairly high number in a school environment. Okay, 22 disciplinary referrals. So I, I noted the nature of the disciplinary referrals. Were they violent? Were they not violent? I noted that two were violent, which is not, it's, it's not a real high number of violent incidents, but in, uh, in May of 2019. Objection, Your Honor, and we're renewing the previous motion about the prior bad acts. All right, over uh, objection, you may testify to this, Doctor. In May of 2019, and again in October of 2019, he had two disciplinary referrals for punching another student in the face. I saw a disciplinary referral in March of 2019 where he was uh, referred because he was cheating. He had the math answers on his phone. Um, I saw mostly disciplinary referrals for characterizations of him being disrespectful to teachers, um, disruptive in the class environment. Um, or just kind of oppositional with, with teacher demands and also on the bus. So those disciplinary issues over that span of time resulted in at least three out of school suspensions and at least four in school suspensions. So that's again between 11 and 14, which he was in eighth when he was in uh, 14. So that would have been going back to about the sixth grade where behavioral things seem to very likely affect his progress and his academics, which the majority of his teachers recognized and talked about. How does that compare to, you know, comparing the individual of Aiden Fucci to um, a group of his peers, juveniles? Uh, and what you know about the comp the occurrence of suspensions and things like that. Right, it's, it's important to know because in a vacuum, we don't know if that's relevant or not, So, but it's not in a vacuum. So what we know is that individuals in school, juveniles, that's kindergarten through 12th grade, um, suspensions rates nationally, in this was 2019, was uh, 5%. So 5% of students got suspended at least one time. That was actually down from a couple of years before that where it was 7%. But it, it hovers around that area in, in the last 10 years or so where 5, 6, 7% of students um, get at least one suspension during a year. So the point is, it's unusual. So, so we can, we can uh, knowledgeably say that Mr. Fucci getting suspended from school is unusual for his group of peers, relative to his group of peers, it, it's an unusual thing and it, it you know, provides us some information to make some judgments about him. And then moving on to um, that mental and emotional health, um, I think you've already commented on the, the teachers, but teachers and then I believe uh, his two closest friends, Zophie and Trey, provided a lot of that insight for you. Is that right? Yes, that's um, mental and emotional health. I'll, if I may, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go back over the teachers a little bit just because I didn't cover everything. So there was some consistency in what teachers related about their experience with Mr. Fucci and there were some things that were a little bit inconsistency inconsistent between teachers the consistent points were teachers said consistently um, without exception he has the ability to understand and comprehend okay uh, he seems to understand right from wrong he seemed to understand there were consequences for uh, inappropriate conduct or not doing your work or whatever. Um, they all were consistent in relating that they had never seen Mr. Fucci uh, appearing that he was responding to voices in his head or making the verbalization that he heard voices in his head. So those were the consistent things among, amongst teachers, and, and I think really relevant. It speaks to a lot of things, including, you know, ability to appreciate risks and consequences in general, understanding right from wrong, 
he knew these things in a general way, according to, to um, teachers. Now, some of the inconsistent things between teachers, uh, you know, there was bad and good. Uh, one of his ESE teachers that spent a lot of time with him in the seventh grade was Alyssa Gates. And she said Aiden was a pleasure to work with. He, he worked hard. There was no behavioral issues whatsoever. Um, he did what she asked, asked uh, him to do, seemed to want to do well and achieve. So that's kind of one end of the spectrum from one teacher, whereas other teachers, for example, one of the teachers, uh, you know, described him straight out, said he was a punk. Um, his PE teacher, it was uh, teacher Jay Shepard, said that he was difficult to deal with, um, said that he rarely, he was defiant and he would rarely dress out for PE, said that he was aggressive, uh, and gave the example that Mr. Fucci would like plow through kids that were in his way because he wanted to walk where those children were standing. So he'd just kind of plow through them. Characterized that Mr. Fucci seemed to always want to get in a fight or an altercation was looking for it. So a little bit of a mixed bag according to what teacher was characterizing their experience with Mr. Fucci in school and it kind of ran the gamut from quiet and respectful to kind of aggressive and, and, and very defiant. And I believe um, Ms. Gates, she was from his previous school, if you recall that, seventh grade. and. If you recall the audios that you listened to, which was the large amount of teachers, were those um, his most recent teachers that law enforcement was interviewing shortly after the murder? Yes, those were his most recent uh, teachers at Patriot Oaks. You're okay. right, Alyssa Gates was a, a later deposition, and she had experience with Mr. Fucci at his previous school in the ESE department. But the eighth grade, teachers and, and the dean and all those that you referenced that were at least more consistent, those were all his current, as of the date of the homicide, That was. And, teachers. And a right. And a lot of those consistencies that I mentioned, I'll even mention that one of the uh, teachers, Mr. Wetjen, W-E-T-J-E-N, he had known Mr. Fucci for quite a long time and described himself as a mentor to Mr. Fucci. So point being, Mr. Fucci had at least one adult mentor in the school environment that was trying to help him. He said Mr. Fucci would seek him out if he was in trouble and they would talk about things. So Mr. Mr. Fucci um, seemed to have some, you know, positive, positive people that he could contact in the school environment to help him out if he needed it. Is that all for the teachers and I along think those so. lines? Yes, and then we yes, move on to his peers, Sophie and Trey. And I know there's a lot of information from Sophie um, that right. law enforcement gathered about him generally is emotional and mental health uh, close in time to this crime. So if you could talk about the things that are of significance to you and, and your ultimate opinions in this case. Right, I think uh, a good place to start is with some of the things that were described by girlfriend Zoffy Bowman. Now, just as a context, Zoffy Bowman and uh, Aiden Fucci had been dating since January or February of 2021, so, so multiple months, spent a lot of time together. Um, Ms. Bowman described that she and Mr. Fucci and some other peers, they were kind of into what she described as gore, um, what she described as horror, H-O-R-R-O-R. -O -R -O -R. So they like to watch horror movies. Um, they like to watch gore, gory horror movies. So she commented about that. She also characterized that, that they all had what she described as dark humor. 
Okay, so, so that was part of the context where she disclosed some of this information. Um, she said that she and Mr. Fucci talked a lot about things they saw on these horror shows and gory movies that a lot of times they would discuss death and killing in the context of these types of movies, okay? Um, but she, she, she went beyond that a bit and she also described that um, her words were, were that Mr. Fucci talked about death and killing a lot, okay? Now he talked about death and killing a lot. She gave a couple of ex examples when uh, Mr. Fucci got really mad at her because she sent a picture of her in a photo with another guy that happened to be her sister's boyfriend or friend that was a boy. And she said that Mr. Fucci got extremely upset about this and his reaction was to say he was going to kill that boy. She also gave an example of uh, Zofi Bowman asking Mr. Fucci, would you like to hang out with me and a couple of my guy friends? And she said that Mr. Uh, Fucci's response to that was to talk about how he was going to kill those two guy friends. So this is important because there was a lot of this killing and death talk from Mr. Fucci that, that's unusual. Um, and and it, was, it was occurring outside of just the context of talking about gory movies, right? Uh, sometimes that was the context, other times it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Like the example of him saying he was going to kill these boys that, that she was around. In that same theme, she talked about, uh, her words were um, that Mr. Fucci talked about wanting to kill her and that he would sometimes do things to her like take his knife out and pretend to stab her or walk up behind her and pretend to slit her throat. Now she indicated she wasn't scared of this. She, she wasn't scared of Mr. Fucci because she trusted him um, with regard to those specific acts. But, but it was interesting that he would make the comment that he wanted to kill his girlfriend, Zofi Bowman. She took it as kind of a joke and is not serious. Um, she also made a, a, a similar comment that I thought was significant that Zofi Bowman said, that's basically why Mr. Fucci no longer stayed at my house because he talked about how easy it would be to kill me when I slept. So you see, this is, this is going beyond just kind of this talk about gory movies. It's, I'm not sleeping at your house because you would be really easy to kill while you're sleeping. A, a really, really peculiar, um, unusual, rare kind of comment repeatedly made to uh, one of Mr. Fucci's closest friends. Now, it even, it even goes beyond this, okay? So, so this is the thing that is, I think, most relevant, although the things I was talking about are relevant to this particular case, but the most relevant um, verbalizations by Mr. Fucci uh, in the Tristan Bailey murder was Zofi Bowman recalled Aiden Fucci telling her that um, basically asking, what would you do if I really killed somebody? And, and then following that up with, uh, expect me to kill somebody um, within this month. So Zofi Bowman was asked if she could pin the date down. She couldn't exactly pin it down, but she said she believed that remark was made by Mr. Fucci in the month of May of 2021, the same month where the murder occurred. Okay, and when, when talking about how he would kill, so, so really it's extensive. It's not just a remark here and there. It seemed to be a real fascination of his. 
um, when he talked about killing somebody, he even told Zoffy Bowman how he would do it. And what he told her was, I would walk around at night and I would find somebody else walking at night. I would drag them in the woods and I would stab them. And then I would pretend like I didn't do it uh, so that I could keep killing people. Now, kind of, again, in a vacuum, that's a weird s statement. That's a weird remark. But this isn't in a vacuum. When we examine that statement occurring close to when Tristan Bailey was murdered and how similar, how remarkably similar it is, it, it speaks to me. It speaks to, it speaks to emotional health, first off. It's, it's unusual. I, I can't stress that enough how unusual it is for a, a peer to be talking about this kind of thing so frequently in such detail with such gore. Um, it, it's just, it's pretty bizarre. And to, to actually carry it out, because that's the other thing. We compare Mr. Fucci to his, his population, other juveniles. Juveniles sometimes make uh, violent remarks Juveniles sometimes talk about violent fantasies. It isn't something that usually kind of predominates what they verbalize um, or is, is a fascination like it seemed to be with Mr. Fucci. But to get as specific as Mr. Fucci got in terms of talking with Zofi Bowman about the things he was thinking, I think it, it really suggests to me that he's giving a glimpse of what he's thinking about, what he's fantasizing about. She even said that she believed he was just talking about a fantasy. But even so, fantasy is rehearsal. Often it's a rehearsal of what we want to do or what we're interested in. Um, so, so there seemed to be a, a lot of that going on with, uh, with um, Mr. Fucci preceding the murder of Tristan Bailey that, it, and it's different because he actually carried it out. Okay, he carried out that fantasy. He just didn't verbalize it. He verbalized what he'd like to do and that he would do it soon, and he actually did it, which, which suggests some rehearsing of that very kind of instance with Tristan Bailey. Is that sort of verbalization and all the different pieces of evidence that you have that point to that thought process is that even unusual amongst juveniles that commit violent acts? It is. It's very unusual. And again, it's not, it's not that uncommon for juveniles to talk about something violent occasionally or get in a fight occasionally, but to talk about death and dying um, in, in almost a preoccupied way, uh, it's, it's extremely, extremely unusual. And, and, and that that violent, not punching somebody in the face, stabbing somebody. He also made the uh, comments to his best friend, um, Trey Absher, that I'll talk about next in, in that same vein. And before we move on to Trey, um, when you were originally talking about how some of the context of these comments were in sort of a shared interest of watching horror movies with Zofie, his girlfriend, um, did she explain, though, a difference between what she was interested in and what Mr. Fucci was interested in, in that respect? Yes, thank you for reminding me of that. Yes, yeah, so, so that was an interesting thing, too. So Zofie Bowman made it clear, I like gore and horror, but it was, it was fictional. It wasn't real. It was a movie. It was pretend, right? But um, she said that she commented about Mr. Fucci actually pulling up videos off the internet that were real life gore videos. So they're out there. So real life gore videos of, of she said, somebody getting his head chopped off or somebody getting shot. And that was a distinction she made. She said, yeah, I like gore, but it's fictional and fake. Whereas he, he seemed to look for the real life, um, not TV stuff and he enjoyed looking at that. Um, Sophie had also witnessed Mr. Fucci outside of herself uh, commit a violent act or, or be in a fight 
I believe as well, close yeah, in time. She she talked about seeing him violent when he beat up another kid at a um, at a food truck one Friday night. Basically, stole his vape pen. Mr. Fucci told stole the kid's vape pen, and the child wanted it back. And Mr. Fucci beat up the child. And when he described um, the type of people he wanted to kill, do you recall what Sophie? Um, indicated the type of people, whether they were people he liked or didn't like. Well, he, he, said, he said he wanted to kill people he liked, and she specifically referenced in that case that he, he kind of pulled that from a horror movie. He related to that line in the horror movie of killing somebody you liked. She also indicated that he, he typically talked about killing, uh, killing other, other guys less so about girls, more about guys. Okay. And then what information, if any, did his closest best friend, Trey Absher, have consistent or inconsistent with Sophie? I mean, it's more of the same thing. So I think uh, one of the differences um, in Trey Absher in terms of what Mr. Fucci verbalized to him is the statement it would be satisfying to slit somebody's throat. And the statement, it would be satisfying to watch the blood drain out. Now, really unusual, again, unusual for anybody to make those remarks as that, that satisfying, right? right? What was interesting is Trey Absher had a response that I thought represented what what is within the within the realm of normal, a normal response to these remarks by Mr. Fucci. So I think it would be satisfying to slit somebody's throat. I think it would be satisfying to watch the blood drain out. Uh, Trey Absher's remark was it was weird and not normal. And he even said that I can't imagine stabbing somebody like that, especially repeatedly. Okay, so it's interesting to think about. That's a normal response. Most of us can't imagine doing this harm to another person, especially in such violent and close-up way. Um, and, and that was Trey's experience of those remarks. But uh, Mr. Fucci didn't have it, seemed to have any compunction to making those remarks and understand you know, the effect it had on even his friend. Dr. Pritchard, um, kind of moving into the information you gathered about Mr. Fucci's general background, his family, home, and community, um, what of significance did you note was present and not present about Mr. Fucci's background that ultimately adds to some of the opinions you give in this case? Right. So. Um this was a little bit of a mixed bag, too, depending on who you asked. So I'll, I'll go with Zoffy Bowman and uh, Trey Absher first, peers. So Zoffy Bowman, in particular, talked about um, Mr. Fucci telling her that things were really difficult at home, that he did not feel very, uh, very loved or appreciated by his parents. Um, he felt like he was the least important and least liked out of all the family. Um, Zoffy Bowman also said that Mr. Fucci described that his biological father, Jason Fucci, was sometimes physically abusive. She indicated she chronicled four specific incidents where Mr. Fucci told her that uh, dad choked him one time slapped him one time and punched him two times. So four separate incidents of, of what she described as Mr. Fucci saying Jason Fucci was physically abusive towards him. Um, she also described that mother was not a very good mother figure. Um, she went so far as to say that Mr. Fucci described what she believed was emotional abuse in the home from mother. Um, she related that she had urged Mr. Fucci to uh, report it 
She was concerned enough to say, you need to report this. This is emotional abuse. Um, as time went on, she dropped that idea because Mr. Fucci was, was, didn't seem very responsive to her concern about emotional abuse in the home. So those were the suggestions from peers that some things were going on at home that were you know, less than healthy. Um, now, the, uh, the P, uh, I'm sorry, the siblings of Mr. Fucci, and that would be Dylan Hicks and that would be Preston Fucci, did not characterize that there was any abuse in the home. Okay. Um, in fact, Dylan Hicks described uh, Jason Fucci as a fantastic father, as a very good father figure who was basically always there for him. Um, characterize a different kind of discipline than uh, Zofi Bowman uh, indicated that Mr. Fucci told her, and the discipline was essentially he got spanked on the butt by Jason Fucci if he did something wrong. Um, also, that, that discipline in the home involved uh, go to your room, um, not being able to have contact with your peers, or taking away your cell phone. So obviously a very different characterization from Sophie Bowman suggested, suggesting that Mr. Fucci said that Jason was, in particular was physically abusive and mom was emotionally abusive. Grandmother, uh, Deborah Spywack, that's maternal grandmother of Mr. Fucci. Um, she's been in the home a lot. She used to live there during the week, had, a, had another home, and that's where she'd go during the weekend, but spent a great deal of time with Aiden Fucci and the family. Um, she didn't characterize that there were any problems in the home at all. She essentially said that everybody got along well, that Jason Fucci was a fantastic father, um, that Michael Akel, stepdad, was a fantastic father, uh, that Crystal Smith, Deborah Spywack's own daughter, was a wonderful mother. Uh, she, she said that since the split of Mr. Fucci's biological parents, so blended family, two different households, that neither parent had ever missed one of their prescribed weekends that they had custody of Aiden and, and uh, his siblings. So she described that it was, it was very positive, that everybody worked hard, that it was very conscientious parenting, that the children had all they needed and wanted. She described them as, as spoiled kids, in fact. She described herself as very close to Aiden Fucci. So um, again, a little bit of a mixed bag. Uh, most of the people in the home, um, other than Aiden Fucci, were describing what I would say is, is fairly normal e existence in that home, whereas what came from Zofi Bowman, which is what came from Aiden Fucci, was there were some incidents of perhaps physical abuse in the home, and what uh, Zofi Bowman perceived in the description from Aiden Fucci to be emotional abuse from mother. And again, comparing this individual to similar peers and in, in, in the criminal justice system, juveniles that you've looked at, um, how did his background sort of compare to other backgrounds that you, that you witness and see that contribute to behaviors and things? I mean, I would say, relatively speaking, he had a, a very good background. Of course, in the criminal realm, we see a lot of poverty often. We see a lot of abuse. We see a lot of drug addiction. There was also comment, commentary that Mr. Fucci's parents didn't use alcohol or drugs. So I would say he had a very good upbringing, relatively speaking. We didn't see any of that clear dysfunction that you often see in, in uh, criminal cases. We didn't see poverty. We saw a picture of the house earlier, at least I would say middle class family, middle class household. Um, a lot of people interested, um, grandmother, biological father, stepmom, biological um, mom, stepdad, siblings. Um, so a lot of people interested in, in Mr. Fucci and his sibling and his family's lives, which is also sometimes not seen in, in the criminal context. So I would say, relatively speaking, uh, it, was, it was pretty unremarkable, pretty, pretty normal you know, existence for him. Okay. 
And then moving on to one of the other larger um, categories of factors that you considered. Um, talk about what you learned through the records and how that relates to the effect of any immaturity, impetuosity, failure to appreciate risks and consequences. Um, and obviously the importance of this is how the, all that relates to his participation in the offense. Right, participation in the offense. So I've talked about uh, immaturity. Um, you know, the important thing I think is he's 14 and a half. So he's immature relative to an older population. Okay, so all 14 year olds are relative to young adults or older adolescents. But relative to his peers, um, no description of him being immature. Uh, immaturity related to the crime, it's so unusual. The behavior is so unusual in this case, you know, for a 14 and a half year old, that it, it's, hard, it's hard to know if, if immaturity played any role whatsoever. I can't really offer an opinion on that um, beyond what I've already said. What about impetuosity? Impetuosity, I would pull in. I would pull in what I would describe as fantasies, the pre-existing experience of violent fantasies in Mr. Fucci's head that he verbalized to peers that were very descriptive, that were very similar to what happened to Tristan Bailey. I would say that suggests to me some rehearsal, perhaps some premeditation. And, and when I say perhaps some premeditation, when he says, expect me to kill somebody this month, um, and he's already kind of outlined how he would do it, it seems like he had some rehearsal of that in his head before it occurred. And, and so, so that was important, okay? It, it, suggests, it, it suggests the opposite of, of impetuosity. So if you're planning it, planning it and thinking about it fairly extensively before it occurs, it's not impetuous, that's more planned, okay? He even made that comment to Zofi Bowman, if he does it, it's gonna be planned, mm -hmm. okay? So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it, I would say, and a really important one, is the actual crime, okay? so. These terms, impetuosity, okay, what does that really mean? Well, impetuosity, impulsivity, lack of forethought, where you just kind of do something and you don't think about it and you don't think about the consequences, it's essentially what it means in this, in this context. So the crime, and I, I would like to illustrate my point with a, with a hypo hypothetical, if I may. Yes. Okay, I'm so. Objecting, Your Honor. There's no question being posed. I can pose a question. All right. Again, um, the court has heard the facts, and I know you'll weave them into your answer about the nature of this crime. Right. Um, if you were to compare the nature of the crime itself that Aiden Fucci committed to the larger group of his peers and juveniles that commit violence, um, why is it that you call this particular act not impetuous? And what is an example of one that would be? Okay, so um, in terms of what what an ex is an example of one that would be that I've seen in my own experience. Sorry, an objection again, Your Honor. So now he's describing the nature of a crime. He's here qualified as an expert in psychology, not in crime scene, or or even in detailing the nature of a crime. So I'm objecting to this line of question. In my I can't hear all right, she's going to repeat her right. objection. And I apologize. I, defense is objecting to the line of questioning. Dr. Pritchard has been qualified uh, before the court as a psychologist, not a crime scene expert, or in the nature of homicides. So to this question and this line of questions, defense counsel is objecting. Your Honor, the issue of impetuosity is one of the most important um, factors within the factors it's one that dr bloomfield is going to testify about as well and the doctor is clearly clear clearly qualified and has a lot of experience in seeing juvenile crimes and the varying types of those crimes so he's simply trying to describe why he believes this one is not an impetuous act and an example of what 
an impetuous act would be. He's describing impetuousness within juveniles or within criminals and the differences between categorizing something as non-impetuous and impetuous. All right, the objection is overruled. Uh, doctor, you remember the question? Yes, Your Honor. You may answer it. Thank you. So the example of, of to illustrate, of what I would consider impetuous, impetuous crime, for example, uh, a youth goes into a convenience store with a gun with an intent to rob the clerk. The clerk reaches under the counter and the youth fires the gun and hits the clerk and runs out of the store. Okay, So impetuous, impetuous meaning there's no indication that youth had plans to shoot the clerk. Okay. Um, there's indication that it was kind of an immediate reaction, um, maybe believed he might be shot, so he pulled the gun. So I would say that would be a good example of likely impetuosity or impulsivity. Now, to change a few of the dynamics in that hypothetical, okay, that same youth goes into the to the uh, convenience store with a gun to rob the clerk. The clerk gives money to the youth with the gun and is not armed. There's no firearm under the thing. So he gets the money and the youth takes the money and then shoots the clerk. And then he walks over to the counter and shoots the clerk 20 more times while the clerk is lying on the, on the ground. So you see in those two different examples, impetuosity in the first one, impulsive, we don't know intent to really do anything when he entered the store versus the second example where there seems to be clear intent. So clear thought and plan to shoot the clerk, whether he got the money or not, to kill the clerk don't shoot him once, you go over and you shoot him 20 times. So it, it seems far less impetuous and impulsive than the first example. And I would say that's a, a good uh, direct comparison to the Aiden Fuji case. Okay. So. And why in this overall realm of milligram considerations, opinion, psychology, everything that came out of those cases, why is that factor so important? It's so important because that's why these juvenile sentencing laws came into effect, because youth are typically impetuous or can be impetuous relative to adults. There's no question juveniles are different than adults, and we have to consider that. So they can be impetuous. They can do something without giving it much thought that can affect um, their life. Uh, forever and the lives of others forever and we have to consider so that's why we have to kind of analyze it to see does it look impetuous in this case or does it not look impetuous okay so that's why it's relevant and that's why it's important to look at the individual <laughs> all these factors we've gone through and the act itself right yes you always have to look at the individual every forensic case you're looking at an individual you're not you're not evaluating a group. I was asked to evaluate Aiden Fucci, not a group. But that being said, when you evaluate an individual um, in a forensic context, you're making comparisons to the group that he comes from. That's the comparison sample. So, so as I said, so these things are in a vacuum. How do I know that suspensions um, matter? Okay, I know they matter because it's unusual for his, his peer group. So I can say Mr. Fucci as an individual is unusual in the sense that he gets suspended whereas 95% of his peers do not. And, and that's kind of how we go about it. So I'm, I want to compare him in all the things I'm talking about the context and the, and the uh, comparative sample is his peer group, juveniles. And under that same factor, again, I believe there was one other consideration we've talked about into this impetuous analyzation, fantasies, the nature of the crime. Um, you also mentioned your report cover-up. How does that play? 
apart. Yeah, so, so cover up. Um, I didn't really talk about how it was a protracted crime. It was a long okay. crime, <laughs> right? Um, relatively speaking. So in the example I gave, go in, shoot, leave takes mm -hmm. a second or two maybe versus go in, uh, rob, shoot once, shoot 20 more times. It takes a, long, a, a, a lot longer relative to the first example. So in this, in this crime with Mr. Fucci, his uh, you know, inflicting 114 <coughs> wounds, it takes a long time. It doesn't speak to impetuosity to take that long. There's thought going on in his head as this is playing out. How long exactly did it did it play out for? We don't know. Let's say a couple minutes. Objection, for a, Your Honor. Speculation. For for 114 stab wounds versus one or two seconds in the impetuous example I gave, had Mr. Fucci stabbed Tristan Bailey once or twice. Impetuous, impulsive, probably. 114, I think you really would have a problem making that argument legitimately. Even if you didn't have that premeditated fantasy information, the crime itself speaks to that, right? Exactly. Even if you didn't have that premeditation, although I would say clearly he did. Clearly it's there. It's in his head beforehand. So, so then the, the final thing would be the cover-up. Okay. So that, this really plays to appreciation of risks and consequences, all right? Mm -hmm. So cover up. When somebody tries to cover up a crime, the implication is they understand the risks and potential consequences of that crime. And their effort is to not get caught because they recognize it's wrong. Okay, it, it, all, it all plays into that. So in Mr. Fucci's case, the cover up would be getting rid of the murder weapon probably not too long after the crime occurred. We don't know how long, but um, it, it, was in the, it was in the retention pond right near her body. So he got rid of the murder weapon. Okay, so murder weapon, immediately get rid of it. Um, because he recognizes that he doesn't want to have that or else he'd be caught and implicated and he doesn't want to be implicated. Same for all other aspects of cover-up. Hiding the shoes behind the bureau, hiding the t-shirt under the bureau, um, lying to people. So lying to Zoffy Bowman and, and Trey about what happened to Tristan before the body was discovered. Lying to his parents when they were talking to him in the interview room. Lying to authorities about what occurred. So why do we lie? We lie because we don't want to get caught, because we know we've done something wrong. So it's appreciation of, of, of potential consequences that you don't want for yourself. And that's what generates the behavior. So, so it seems to be clear indication that he's appreciating um, that related to, to his case with that cover-up behavior. Okay. And that blended into um, factor I, which was the... <laughs> Uh, any effect of his characteristics of youth on his judgment. So you sort of outlined um, that he was able to think through and, and cover up evidence, uh, at least in, in his manner. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, the effect of his youth on his judgment. So the judgment to kill Tristan Bailey, is that related to his youth? I don't know how anybody could say it is or it isn't. I don't know. That's hard to identify, but um, he was de obviously demonstrating judgment throughout that. Judgment in terms of, you know, the stab wounds, the number of stab wounds. Right. Um, the cover-up, that's judgment. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, clearly demonstrating judgment, but how, how, how much that judgment related to the decision to kill Tristan Bailey is related to his youth Again, it's a really unusual act. This, this murder is really unusual. I, I don't know how you could say it's related to his youth or not. And when you, you give that opinion, do you have some, again, statistics of the group, the juvenile group, to sort of compare him to on violent acts? Well, yeah, just, well, on violent acts, yes. So just generally viol violent acts committed by juveniles. So the 
entire group of juveniles who commit um, criminal acts, uh, violent acts are about seven percent of those criminal acts. So, so it's a small, it's a small person. I'm sorry, that's that's incorrect. Okay. So, of all the violent acts, seven percent are murders. Okay, so that's. So it's unusual. So murder by juveniles, all the violent acts, only seven percent are murders. So it's unusual. Okay, now that's the, honor to the again. Now he's talking statistics, and he's being called as a psychologist. Well, I'll also stay in the objection unless you have something to cite. Uh, I provided okay. it to I think both councils. <clears throat> <coughs> Dr. Pritchard, you did. You provided we, a. We do have a copy, Your Honor, but it's from the criminal. It's from the U.S. federal organization, and the, it's not APA or the Association of Psychiatrists and Psychologists. Let me oh. make the link. The if objection's I can. overruled. So yes, it's it's unusual. Okay, and again, why it's relevant to your work in this case is what? What are you looking at in making recommendations and opinions to this court? Um, about this defendant. Are you looking at all juveniles or are you looking at Aiden Fucci? I'm looking at Aiden Fucci, but I'm comparing him again to, to all juveniles. That's, that's the reference sample. And we have to see is Aiden Fucci, is there anything about him that's different um, as an individual based on what we know about other juveniles and what's normative or normal behavior with those juveniles? Okay. And all of that is, again, comes out of, as you're aware, the Miller and Graham decisions and why courts, and especially in Florida, court has discretion here. Um, so the court is to look at the individual, and you're here to provide insight and compare him to other similarly situated juveniles. Is that fair? That's correct. That's fair. Okay. There's two very brief um, factors, uh, brief comment you probably have on those um, that the courts to consider. Um, the extent, it's F and G, the extent of his participation in the offense and any pressure on him by outside uh, peers um, in this case. So did you see any evidence um, of anyone else's involvement or influence on Aiden Fucci in this case? Nobody else's involvement. It appears that he acted alone, and it did not appear that anybody influenced him, either peers or family. One of the last um, sections you discuss in your report is um, the possibility of rehabilitating the defendant. Um, and there's some different information in addition to the rest that you talk about in that section. Um, so if you would kind of talk about your opinion on that and then what that opinion is based on. All right, so the possibility of rehabilitating the defendant, a lot of times the best information to get on this variable is comes from um, after, after the crime occurred, when they're incarcerated, how are they doing? How are they adjusting? Are they demonstrating things clinically that we, we would like to see, like some compassion and some sorrow and what went wrong and how can I, you know, do things better and I feel so bad for the family, anything like that. <laughs> Um, or do we see things that are more negative that doesn't really speak to the person trying to get better or maybe even recognizing or acknowledging or taking responsibility for what they've done? So in Mr. Fucci's case, the information comes from um, Duval County Jail where there's commentary, and I got much of this or some of this from the deposition from Sergeant Cox there at the jail. Sergeant Cox's deposition talked about how Mr. Fucci had been functioning in the jail. One of the things that Sergeant Cox indicated that Your Mr. Honor, we would renew the objection regarding the new acts without any conviction that were cleared by the um, same paperwork. The objection is overruled. Can I repeat that for the You may. Defense renews the objection for the post-arrest acts, bad acts, without a conviction, that he was cleared in the same people that Dr. Pritchard was now relying on, or at least moving forward with this question. The objection is overruled. Go ahead, Doc. Right, so um, the, the, 
general indication from Sergeant Cox was that since Mr. Fucci has been in the jail, he has been given, given opportunity to be in the general population at the jail. And I guess I should say that at the jail, he's housed with other juveniles who are direct filed. So these are other juveniles who have serious charges. They're not with adults. So it's a, another juvenile population, but is in the adult jail. Um, had opportunity in the general population, but according to Sergeant Cox, has never, it's never worked out for Mr. Fucci because of his own behavior. See, the benefit of being in general population is you get to come out of your cell eight hours per day and socialize and, you know, play games and watch TV, whereas other places that they are housed, if their behavior is not good, they don't get those level of privileges. So Sergeant Cox described that Mr. Fucci has not been able to make it in the general population very well because he always gets sent back to administrative confinement or disciplinary confinement or seclusion because of something he has done. He mentioned some of the things that Mr. Fucci had been doing in the Duval County Jail that uh, resulted in him not being able to stay in the general population. and. Uh, essentially, one of the main things was he was extorting commissary, so commissary that he gets um, all the all the inmates get, you know, snacks and things. He was extorting the commissary from smaller juveniles at the at the jail. Um, when asked about how this extortion was taking place, essentially Sergeant Cox was characterizing that. Uh, Mr. Fucci would make threats, um, uh, threats like, if you don't give me your commissary, I'm going to uh, ask them to put you in my cell. So it's kind of an implied threat there. Sometimes was explicit it as um, uh, threatening to harm or kill the other inmate if he did not uh, give the commissary to Mr. Fucci. It happened to at least two, um, two additional inmates there uh, early on, and then it, it sounded like it happened to two additional ones with diff different initials later on where he was extorting the commissary. Um, there were a couple of complaints by other inmates that Mr. Fucci was, was threatening them. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your people. Um, was threatening to stab them. Uh, there was one indication by Sergeant Cox. Uh, he provided a, um, if, I may, if I may refer to my report real, uh, real quick and find the actual quote. Paragraph two, maybe one yes. or two. So, so one of the uh, specific quotes was uh, attributed to Mr. Fucci toward another juvenile. When I go to general population or when I get a chance, I'm going to stab you and I can't wait. I'm going to look you straight in the eye. Right. And uh, so these really explicit again, unusual comments. So uh, ma ma doing this extortion, doing these threats, um, manipulating, kind of bullying to get things he wanted, and even referencing, uh, even referencing his, his case in, in uh, the process of threatening or trying to extort. So uh, the idea being that Mr. Fucci seemed to be using the incident, and that is the murder and the characteristics of that murder, to exploit and to get what he wants in the jail environment. Okay? And, and in the absence of, there, there's, it's really callous to make those statements. Most of us see that. Uh, it's callous to make those statements. That, um, you know, I'm going to stab you like he did to Tristan Bailey. Um, so it's, uh, there, there's concern for me clinically 
that he is not demonstrating any kind of compassion, any kind of understanding, and maybe he can't understand the, what he's caused, the, the, the terrible, terrible uh, situation he has caused for so many people. Uh, Tristan Bailey's family, the community, his own family. So really a, a, a real void in terms of demonstrating some conscience, some, some understanding that this was terrible and expressing any kind of sorrow for it. And closer in time to the, to the actual murder, you had a little, a few more pieces of evidence of insight to him. You had um, the Snapchat videos and then the interaction with his parents. Did you see anything in that evidence that would relate to his um, ability to be rehabilitated and just his general reaction to the crime and yeah, how that applies? Yeah, so um, again, the, it's just the unusual, incredible callousness about his behavior in the back of the police car. Okay, that's that's really, really unusual. And, and you know, it, it does not suggest clinically that this this child, Mr. Fucci, has the same kind of makeup that most of us do and moral compass that most of us do. Okay, so um, it, it's exceptionally callous. At that point, he was the only person on the planet that knew where Tristan Bailey was and her status as deceased. And he's laughing and joking and peace sign and has anybody seen Tristan, uh, Tristan lately? So really, really callous and concerning. He didn't seem to, he actually seemed to be having a good time with Trey in the back of the police car. Um, didn't seem to uh, be that nervous with his parents either when he was speaking to them. So he's got this emotional makeup that for me would be clinically very concerning and for me would suggest that he doesn't have, I would say at this point, I don't see him as a good candidate for prognosis. He's not demonstrating what I would like to see clinically to say, yeah, we, we have some hope for this guy getting better. He's not demonstrating that, so I would say that at this point, his prognosis is poor for rehabilitation. And doctor, overall, these post Graham Miller factors, the 10 that we have sort of covered today, or primarily the nine that I've gone over with you, um, the goal of those is to sort of analyze the, the individual, the crime, uh, give the court some guidance um, as to how to sentence this particular juvenile. Are they unique in stature, or are we just talking about a general impetuous juvenile? Um, any final thoughts, additional thoughts, and ultimately your opinion on that in this case? I, I would just say that uh, the overall thought for me is, is that he's a really unique person, I would say, uh, in a bad way. He's, he's demonstrating some things that I think are extremely clinically concerning that we u usually do not see in youth, um, that often we don't see in youth murders. So um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, again, his ability to kind of grow out of this, maybe, maybe, but he's also got some personality things that are really concerning. Thank you, Your Honor. No more questions. Ross, Your Honor, could we just have a five-minute break? Sure. Take a five-minute break. I get
City Judge County Circuit Court will return to order. You all be seated. Thank you. All right. We're back on the record. Yeah. Can I just ask a timing question before we continue? Okay. Um, Miss Peoples, Miss Peoples said 15 minutes, so let's give her 30 minutes. <laughs> Essentially, I just want to know when your honor wants to stop for the day so we can make some decisions, because we would be moving next into family after that, or we could pick that up in the morning. I'm just trying to, does your honor want to be done 4.30 or 5? How many witnesses do you have, or family impact, uh, victim we impact have, statements do you have left? Fam we have, um, we plan to present six family members and mem uh, members from the community, depending on if we go today or tomorrow. It'll depend on who's here. We're not getting to all of that today, is no, my point. Um, we could start and go into tomorrow, or depending on the breaking we'll, time, we'll, so I was just. We'll plan to go uh, till five o'clock or so. Okay, and then we'll just see. Then address, we would, I'm sorry, because we had just filed a motion regarding the victim impact. We'll, we'll okay. let's finish with this let's, witness. Yeah. We'll move into your motion, okay. and then we'll see where we're at. All right, thank um, you. I did receive your motion, I just saw. Thank you. All right, you may proceed for cross. Dr. Pritchard, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So you, I have received your CV. We're not gonna go through all of it today, but in your past, you were a senior psychologist with the Florida State Hospital. Yes, ma'am. All right, and part of your work there, um, Florida State Hospital and with juveniles in Apalachicola. So you've two different locations, but you've worked with the state in different locations. Yes, ma'am, but uh, Florida State Hospital was not juveniles. Those were adults. The Apalachicola Forest Youth Camp is, uh, is juveniles. Right, so Chattahoochee with, Chattahoochee with adults, Apalachicola with children. Yes, ma'am. All right, and you've evaluated, fair to say, countless individuals for Baker Acts. Yes. All right, uh, and a Baker Acts a form of civil commitment. Yes, ma'am. And a person is Baker acted if they're likely to suffer from neglect or post threat or harm to themselves. There's a laundry list, but in a nutshell. Right, harm to self or others uh, or will suffer from neglect, yes. All right, and a person who cuts himself, uh, they may be depressed. Yes, they may be depressed. All right, there, there could be other reasons, but that could be one of them. Yes, ma'am. All right, and a person who neglects to shower or wash their hair, again, this may be indicator, an indication that this individual is depressed. Yes, it could be. All right, and a person who doesn't change their clothes, again, could be depressed. Not yeah. caring for themselves in general. Right, you're speaking to kind of hygiene issues, and we do see that sometimes, yes, in people who are depressed. All right. And some people who are depressed are also suicidal. Yes. All right. And a person who's experiencing, for example, delusions or hallucinations, they may be suffering or under the influence of illicit drugs. That can happen, yes. All right. And sometimes individuals are experiencing delusions or hallucinations and disorganized speech, again, could be too much alcohol, too much drug use. Yes. All right. Is it fair to say that also an individual who's experiencing delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and I know there are more to that list, could also be experiencing symptoms of schizophrenia, per se, if they had that ongoing for a few months, maybe six? Yes, it could represent what you're describing, delusions, hallucinations, it's psychotic experience, disorganization also. So yes, those are some of the characteristics that can be seen in schizophrenia. All right. Now, regarding adolescent brain, the brain development is not complete until the mid-20s. That is, that is scientific fact, yes. All right. Not up for debate. Right. Okay. And an adolescent tends to use the part of the brain that's more emotional, more impulsive. Yes, that's part of the aspect of the not fully developed brain is they tend to be more impulsive and, and more emotionally driven and don't uh, think things through very well. And that's characteristic of children. Right, it's characteristic. Of, it's characteristics of uh, uh, characteristic of all children on the planet who have not their brains haven't fully developed yet, mid twenties or so. So yes, it's it's typically a characteristic of a, of uh, children. And unlike a child, an adult brain developed, or an adult brain that is developed, it'll have 
the adult brain that is, greater cognitive control, meaning an ability to weigh out a risk. That's true. Okay. And an adolescent, as they grow, that prefrontal cortex or that area of the frontal lobe will start to mature. Yes, that's the last part of the brain to mature, but yes, it, it keeps maturing up through late adolescence and into early adulthood. And unlike a child, an adult with a mature prefrontal cortex will reason better, develop more impulse control, and just make better judgments. Is that fair? Well, in the theory, there's a lot of adults who <laughs> don't do yes. that. But yes, that's the idea is when, they have, when the prefrontal cortex is fully developed, that, that tends to lend to better reasoning and better judge, uh, judgment, less impulsive, uh, impulsivity, um, more, better able to project risks and consequences, that type of thing. And that ability or that final formation of that part of the brain is mid-20s. Yes. Okay. Granted, as you said earlier, there's some adults never really get there. Right. Okay. But children, they're not there at all. Yeah, they don't have the fully developed brain, so they are not there. It doesn't mean that all children have bad judgments, because some don't at all, but um, they are more at risk of that because of that uh, not fully uh, formed prefrontal cortex. Now, is it also fair to say that I heard what you said, but children then lack self-control, or impulse control is the word, I should say. That's one of the risks, yes. And again, all, all ch kids aren't impulsive. You know, it's kind of on a spectrum. So, but they're more at risk of being more impulsive as children because their brains aren't fully developed. And on that same line, then, they're not making well-reasoned judgments. Uh, it, they're not making judgments that um, are consistent with as good as it will be for them when their brain's fully developed. All right. Is cutting a form of self-injury? Yes. And is cutting a form of self-injury that can have several motivations? Yes. All right. And is it a common reason, not the only, but a common reason that individuals will cut to distract from emotional pain? Yes. That okay. is one of the uh, dynamics involved in cutting behavior sometimes. Right. And is it also, again, not the only, but a common reason that some individuals are cutting to distract from the emotional pain because the intensity of the physical pain will distract from that emotion that they don't want to deal with? Yes, that's the idea. All right. Now, is it fair to describe middle schoolers that are participating in drug use as risky behavior? Yes, that's fair. Is it fair to describe middle schoolers that are participating in group sex as risky behavior? Yes. All right. Um, and is it fair to describe middle schoolers that are not, as a group, because kids tend to work together in groups, mm -hmm. that are not listening or obeying their parents on some simple rules, like stay home, would be, again, risky behavior? Yes. All right. Now, you did not evaluate Aiden. That's correct. All right. Um, and you're a trained psychologist, and you did not administer any psychological evaluations on Aiden. Right. I can't if I don't see him. So right. You didn't see him. You didn't evaluate him. Right. All right, then. And with that same line, then, you didn't give any specific test in terms of testing for his executive functioning. I didn't know. All right. And in terms of Aiden's intellectual functioning, you didn't give any specific tests for that. That's correct. And then you did receive a large number of school records, correct? Yes, a right. lot of pages. And within that large body of school records, you didn't see any psychological tests that were administered to Aiden Fuji. I did not. I didn't see a single one. All right, and within those school records, uh, his IQ in relation to the response or the result of a test was not present. Right, I did not see any that I did not see that any formal IQ testing was done with uh, Mr. Fucci in school. So today, you don't know if Aiden's verbal versus his nonverbal IQ what those numbers would be. I I can't say. 
And if there's a difference between Aiden's full-scale IQ and predicted IQ, again, you have no ability to opine on that. No, not really even having talked to Aiden at all. Uh, if I talked to him, I could probably give an impression, but I wasn't able to talk to him. Now, in school, and I'm not asking you line and page, but fair to say that on several of the school years, he was scoring ones and twos on the FSAs. Yes. I mean, it was real consistent in language arts and math, as I indicated. I think it was grade three, four, five on up, um, maybe once in science. Sometimes he scored twos. I never see, saw him score three or higher on that Florida standard assessment. And by the time he's in eighth grade, he's not reading. Well, it's not eighth grade, but for the majority of his school years, he wasn't reading at grade level. No, I mean, the last IEP when he was in eighth grade that was in April of 2021 indicated he was reading at the sixth grade level, so it would have been two uh, grade levels behind in that skill. <coughs> One moment, Your Honor. Near the end of the questioning with the state, you provided an opinion. I mean, I, I imagine I did. I think I may have provided more than one, so I'm not really sure what you're referring to. Yes. Well, you didn't evaluate Aiden. You didn't right. provide any tests to Aiden. Right. Correct? Yes, ma'am. And as a trained psychologist, you know best practices would be to actually perform an evaluation upon it. Right, best practices to do that, uh, the, the desire is to do that, but if we can't do it, it doesn't mean we're uh, not able to perform an evaluation. We're just, relatively speaking, there's a limitation that I mentioned. So we have the records we can evaluate them on, but I couldn't evaluate him uh, in terms of what he had to offer me or doing any testing specifically with him. So today, without an evaluation, you can't give an opinion about any personality disorder or I should say his IQ, for example, where there's actual testing, you cannot provide an opinion on that? Um, not, no, I can't without seeing some hard data, which I don't have. Now, how much do you bill the state per hour on this case? I, I bill $250 an hour. And ultimately, because I know your final billing hasn't gone in, how many hours will you bill on this case? I mean, I would just be uh, guessing at this point. I haven't, I haven't added it up, but I would say probably 50 hours, maybe a little more, a little less. All right. One moment, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Dr. Pritchard, Ms. Peoples asked you in the very beginning, after she asked you about Baker Act information, about um, people that cut themselves. Could that be a sign of depression? And I believe you said it can, and she offered up and agreed there could be several motivations, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you recall um, a specific reason Mr. Fucci gave his friend Michaela Harris um, about a cutting incident. If you don't, I can direct you. I don't know. I, I don't know. I can't pull it up right now. Okay. So I'll, I'll if you would um, refer to page 11, the first full paragraph of your report, when you're relying on Michaela Harris for some of the emotional and mental health. Okay, so page 11, uh, first paragraph. First full, where it says MH. Okay. Um, there's a, just read that and it might refresh your memory about the cutting. Okay. 
Um, yes. Okay. okay. At least one comment he's made about cutting. What was that? Well, he said that when he saw that Michaela cut herself, he thought it was the coolest thing. And according to Michaela, um, Mr. Fucci indicated that he had cut himself one time. Okay. Um, Ms. Peoples asked you a lot of questions about and the obvious answer of no, you didn't evaluate him, you didn't test him. Would you have liked to? Yes. Okay. You were not allowed to? I was not allowed to. Okay. And you described it's limited as you have to. It's, without that, you're limited in how far you can go. And you, you stayed within the records review in this case and provided opinions, correct? Yes. Meaning you didn't provide a mental health diagnosis of Aiden Fucci. I did not provide a mental health diagnosis. And, you know, I, I, I stopped short of providing some opinions that I might have otherwise been able to provide because I wasn't given the opportunity to see him. But, I, I, again, as uh, I've stated, I had a lot of information on which to draw conclusions and opinions. Um, and then ultimately, Ms. Peoples went through some of the the science or psychology that we understand is, is accepted commonly in your field about youth and brain development. And you agree with all of that, correct? I do agree with all of that. It's yeah, scientific fact. I mean, that's why the laws, the juvenile laws were made, because they're not fully developed and they're different than adults. So yes, I believe in all of that. Okay, so just so the court's clear, you're, you're not here disagreeing with those general principles of juveniles? Oh, not at all, no. Okay. Um, what what have you done then based on accepting that premise of juveniles? They're generally immature, they're young, and their brains aren't developed. Um, knowing that information, are you drawing a distinction about this crime as it relates to that knowledge about juveniles? Yeah, I am, and that's the thing. It's, it's um, again, and I've said this several times, all juveniles on the planet, their brains are not fully developed. Okay, that doesn't mean that we're going to see egregious behavior from their, them necessarily. Occasionally we do, and we need to consider the variables. So the unique thing with Mr. Fucci is given all of the, he, he's the same status with a not completely developed brain as every juvenile on the planet. And uh, understanding that and acknowledging that, he still chooses to do something that is extremely rare for, for his uh, group of, of peers, the, the, the sample we compare him to. So, so that's the relevant point. For him, for him as an individual, even though we know all this other stuff about juveniles in general, it's extremely rare and, and very, very uh, different. Okay, no further questions. May this witness be excused? All right. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. All right. At this time, uh, that would conclude the testimonial portion other than victim impact statements for the state. Yes, Your Honor. We're going to take, up, I think, a portion of her motion yeah. now, and then if I could just confer and make a decision on whether we start today or tomorrow, that would be Okay. Great. All right, Ms. Peoples, I did receive your motion to strike cumulative, I believe there's a typo uh, in this motion, but uh, cumulative community letters and restrict victim impact evidence. I do have that motion in front of me. I'll hear from you at this time. I believe it's in excess of 130, nearly 150 letters that are. You're going to have to move to the podium. So we had filed a motion to strike the community letters and restrict the victim impact evidence in this specific case. Uh, Miller Graham or Miller v. Alabama, and that's the basis for Florida Statute 921-1401. Uh, is governed or is in keeping with Miller v. Alabama. 
These statutes are written uh, because children are supposed to be treated different and kids are different. Uh, Aidan Fucci is before the court. He has been direct filed on an indictment of first degree murder and he's entered a guilty plea to that offense. And we're here before the court for a sentencing hearing. However, the nature and the volume of the letters that have been placed before the court is now raising concern and that's why we're filing this motion. That the court would consider these, would in essence deny him his constitutional right to a fair hearing at this juncture. So we're asking the court to strike the letters. I understand that the state is arguing that on 921-1401, that there's two different subsections addressing the community. But we're now dealing with a volume and relevancy issues that are overborne our ability as defense counsel to represent Mr. Fuji. So I'm asking the court to strike the letters uh, and that in terms of the victim impact, again, the state will rely on this, the same statute, 1401, uh, in terms of having the family speak and address the court. And it's not uncommon to have family members come before the court on criminal matters or any criminal matter. The issue is the, the content of what they're before the court with. So we've placed before the court a motion um, addressing these issues that including the victim impact, there are restrictions and that they're not free uh, to trample over the defendant's constitutional rights. So we filed the motion, Your Honor. We're asking to have a reduction uh, in keeping mm -hmm. with, and I know the case is cited here that it's a thumb rule of four members of the family to address the court um, and not have I believe the state has indicated it was six and four, so 10 individuals before the court for the purpose of victim impact and effect on the community. And then I'll rely on the, the motion for the additional argument. Thank you. Thank you. Stay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, well, the first, I think, issue with um, the defense's argument is, is that the, the quote unquote rule of thumb that she cites uh, applies very specifically to death penalty cases. And as the court is well aware, the reason for those rules is that courts have time and again said death is different. Those cases are very unique. The other part is, is that those are victim impact statements that will be presented to a jury who's going to be decide, is going to decide whether the defendant, whether to recommend a death sentence or not. We're not in that, we're not in that type of case. There's no jury here that's making any decisions. Only your honor is making that decision. So those cases are, don't apply under this circumstance. Um, one of the issues that they have is, is that, that the, um, the number of letters um, in this particular case, this is a very unique case in that you know, a lot of the cases we have affect only a small handful of people, uh, family members and maybe a few friends and the victim impact statements that are given in those cases um, correspond with that type of impact. This case is unique in that it had a wide ranging impact on this community. The Bailey family is a large and loving family. There's not just mother, father, sisters, brothers, there's grandparents, there's cousins, there's people in this community um, who, who are greatly impacted by this particular people that Tristan Bailey went to school with. Um, all of them were invested in Tristan Bailey and this greatly affected them. The only case that the defense cited for the, the deal, uh, dealing with the number of cases was this Hamilton case um, and that case is distinguishable from this case in this respect. In that particular case, and this, what, this is really, this was really dicta in the case because the court had already overturned the the, the conviction in the case for other reasons, and it made this side note that during the sentencing hearing, the prosecutor in that case told the judge that he had a petition that had 3,000 signatures on it that demanded the maximum sentence. Well, this is different in this respect. We don't have a petition demanding the highest sentence. We have um, 130 letters 
uh, approximately from each from each each of these individuals who are going to tell the court exactly how this crime affected them. It's not a demand that the court sentence um, Aiden Fucci to life. It is specifically to say this is how this crime that was committed by this defendant affected me personally. Um, the other part of this is um, when it comes to these victim impact statements, they're only one factor that the court has to consider. Um, we're not going to sit up here and tell your honor that you should only listen to these 130 letters. Um, that's only one factor the court can consider. What we're going to tell the court is everything that the court has heard today in terms of all of the other factors in the sentencing statute, the court should consider. This is only one part of that. Um, and again, as I said before, this is not to a jury where there's a risk that the jury can be so overwhelmed by the sheer number um, of letters or sentiments. Um, the court can look at these letters in the proper context and can decide what is appropriate to consider and what's not appropriate. And I trust the court's judgment to do that. All right, thank you. Anything else from the defense? The state provided, sorry, the state provided Serrano v. State, uh, and there are distinctions between Serrano v. State and Aiden Fucci. Uh, there is an objection, and that was one of the first issues that um, they addressed, that there was no objection in the lower court in Serrano v. State, and that there's some indication that the court considered the family member's opinion at sentencing, which we're trying to address right now. So I would say that this is distinct, and that, again, that the Eighth Amendment that we've had several cases, even since Serrano, identifying that these particular juvenile cases, that the kids are different, death is different, but that we treat these juvenile cases with the same attention that we do with the death cases, that it's heightened by nature of the age of the defendant and by nature of the direct file. So I understand the state has provided this case. I do believe that there are some distinctions. Uh, and that in the case that we did put forth before the court that the state is correct, it was a petition. So you're looking at a couple of pages with thousands of signatures. The distinction here is that we're not dealing with one petition, we're dealing with an excess of 130 letters. So I do think there's some similarity with the case that we presented um, in the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, and I'm just gonna just speak again just to she mentioned the Serrano case which I didn't mention before but I had emailed that to her and I emailed it to your J. I have not seen it so Miss Davis was think was going to ask her to send it to you because I didn't have your Maybe email she judge did, but I hadn't checked my email since we've been sitting here so. I can give you the case site judge well, let me okay. see if she sent it to me <clears throat> Sent it 421. You did receive it. I received it five minutes ago. Let yes, me look sir. at it real quick. And it just simply said that the, the family is permitted to address um, what they would like to see the court do with the sentence.
case that was uh, emailed to me, uh, 279 Southern 3rd, 296 Serrano v. State. I'm going to deny the uh, defense motion to strike cumulative community letters and restrict victim impact evidence. Uh, first of all, uh, the court has begun uh, reading the, uh, is it 130 state? Is that a correct number? It's approximately. Okay. Um, Uh, I have begun reading them. Uh, I do agree with the um, defense in the uh, one uh, aspect, and that is that uh, many of them do request a particular sentence, obviously. Um, the court is not reading or reviewing the community impact letters uh, and taking that into consideration, but certainly I am taking into consideration the statements or the impact that uh, this crime had on the family uh, or the community itself pursuant to, uh, again, 921.1401. Uh, so I'm not going to strike any of the community letters. I will obviously review them for the relevant value, uh, which is, uh, again, in determining uh, under 921.1401 the uh, effect of the crime on the victim's family and on the community at large. Um, all right, let's, uh, so that motion is denied. Let's talk about the number of impact statements that you plan to present. Your Honor, there are two persons here today that wouldn't be able to return. So I figured I could start with them and, and then we could pick up in the morning, if Your Honor would like after that. Right, how many total are we going to present? There's six direct family members. And then we have um, six from community members, which would be an assortment of teachers, uh, coaches, and uh, good friends, uh, juvenile friends of Miss Bailey. Well, Some are to be read by, um, one is gonna be read by Mr. Johnson, one's read by the victim advocate, and the rest would be in person. Are those letters, the ones that are going to be read by the victim advocate and Mr. Johnson, are those community individuals or are those vic or family members? Those would be um, not family. They would be, um, they're from the community and right. close relationship to I have family. a copy of those? No, you do not. These, right. We present, have these back. Present those to me and I will read those myself. I don't need them to be read in open court. If they're from family members, that would be different. Okay but we were already looking at 12 victim impact statements, so we're gonna reduce that at least by those two. I will review those letters myself. Yes, sir. The uh, victim impact statements from the family members, obviously, uh, we'll hear from all of them. Um, and then the other, I guess, four community uh, letters or community impact statements you can present. Now, are two of those going to be read today? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Do you want them to sit in the witness I think I'd stand. rather have them sit just in case. That'd be fine. Okay. Now at this time the state would call um, Bree Cherry. Bree Cherry. All right. Ms. Cherry, go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Make yourself comfortable and try to speak into that microphone, okay? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> and Ms. Cherry, before you just read your letter, for the record, state your name and your relationship to Tristan Bailey. Yes, um, my full name is Brianna, B-R-E-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, last name Cherry, um, and I was Tristan's all-star cheerleading coach. Okay, and you can go ahead and read your letter. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, as I just stated, my name is Bree Cherry, and I was Tristan Bailey's all-star cheerleading coach. Um, I've always referred to my athletes as my cheer children because that's what they are. <clears throat> During peak season, I would spend more time with my cheer children than I did my own bi biological ones at home. In the cheer world, not only do these kids become yours, but these teammates become family. 
They spend countless hours in the gym, forming a sisterhood through blood, sweat, tears, hugs, high fives, and hit zeros, which is when they hit a perfect routine. It's an unbreakable bond we all experience in a community like no other. I tell you all of this so you can get a small grasp of what Tristan meant to her coaches, her gym, and her cheer sisters. There's nothing in the coach's handbook that could have ever prepared me for what I would face on the horrific day that was May 9th, 2021. I was in Orlando, Florida, coaching at the Cheerleading Worlds for just one week before. I stood in the exact same spot with Tristan as she competed at the summit. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, the summit was the Super Bowl of cheerleading for Tristan's team and age group. We were on top of the world after having an incredible showing at the biggest competition of the year. We were so excited for the future of these young athletes and all of the incredible talent we would be starting the new season with. Then one week later, our lives changed forever and not for the better. Aiden Fuji selfishly <laughs> took Tristan away from so many people who loved and needed her. Our team lost its leader. These athletes lost their sister. And I lost a piece of my heart that I'm, I'll never be able to get back. I, I wrote this letter to speak out for myself, but to also speak on behalf of Tr Tristan's cheer sisters whose lives will never be the same. Tristan's teammates' ages ranged from eight years old to 13 years old. And the impact didn't just stop at Tristan's teammates and coaches. You see, we had 200 athletes in our gym, and those athletes have siblings, parents, aunts, cousins, grandparents, etc. All of these people make up our gym family. When you have the heart and the personality that Tristan did, your impact stretches far beyond those in your immediate corner. We all gathered to grieve, and the image of these kids on their knees, screaming and sobbing as no adult could console them, will be etched into my memory forever. In the days to come, not only are we mourning the loss of Tristan, but we're forced to hear the horrific details of what happened to this person we love so much. How do you tell an eight-year-old child it's going to be okay when they have to hear from the world around them that she was brutally murdered by her schoolmate? It's our job to protect our children. And due to the nature of this crime, there was no way to hide these details from these babies. These details will continue to haunt each and every one of us on a daily basis. There is nothing we can do to fix the hurt, remove the fear, or bring Tristan back. And unfortunately, as these kids get older, the pain will only become more severe as they bring their own children into the world and try to protect them from evil. I come to the court pleading for the maximum sentence for Aiden Fucci. Even more, I beg and plead that the person reading this letter 25 years from now will think about all these kids and what they have been through. The complete fear and terror we would all feel knowing, <clears throat> the complete fear and terror we would all feel should any sort of release ever be considered. The Bailey family and each and every person who knew and loved Tristan has endured enough. Because of his age, Aiden Fucci cannot receive the death penalty. He gets a chance at life. Tristan didn't get that chance. The years will go on for him, but our reality is that this horrific nightmare will never end. Our hearts will break every single day for the rest of our lives because Tristan is no longer here. Thank you for your time and consideration now and in the heartbreaking years to come. Tristan Bailey Strong. Thank you, Your Honor. Here we would call Susan Thistleton. Have a seat, make yourself comfortable, man. 
just that microphone so that you're not right up there. Okay. That's good. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Susan Thistleton, and I'm a teacher at Patriot Oaks and the mother of Tristan Bailey's classmate, Cameron Thistleton. I'm reading you an abbreviated version of my impact statement. I have submitted my letter and my son's letter, and I hope you have a chance to review. May 9th, 2021 was one of the worst days for my family that I could ever recall. What started out as a fun, relaxing day on the water with my children for Mother's Day turned into every parent's worst nightmare. First, we got the text, has anyone seen Tristan? My first thought, she snuck out, fell asleep at her friend's house, and just hadn't woken up. Her parents will hear from her any minute. Hours went by. My children and I waited for updates. Our next update was that she might have been seen with Aiden Fucci. My heart sank. I didn't know Aiden. I never met him, but I knew of him. And right then and there, I knew it wasn't going to end well. I stayed glued to my phone, neighbors, coworkers, and friends, praying for good news. Then news came that her body was found in the wooded area. Now I was faced with the task of telling my 13-year-old son that his friend and classmate was dead. He would immediately know who was responsible. We all did. Why was this so hard for me? My son Cameron came to Patriot Oaks as a fourth grader. We had moved to Florida from Colorado. Cameron had some academic issues and he had some behavioral issues and we were constantly trying to help him with those. His behavior often alienated him from other kids and made him feel inferior to others. At all that time, Cameron had one constant and immediate friend, one person who never judged him, never alienated him, and never made him feel worse than he already did, and that was Tristan. She was a constant source of support, friendship, and positivity that Cameron needed. She made him want to do better, to be better. She was his true cheerleader. I didn't fully understand the impact she had on his life until she was gone. When I broke the news to Cameron, he was crushed. He sobbed, he asked why, he got pissed. He asked so many questions and had so many wonderings. Mom, did she suffer? Did she know he was trying to kill her? Do you think she was cold? Aren't boys supposed to protect girls? I could not answer any of his questions, so I just held him tight and cried with him. How do you begin to process those questions? Cameron missed several days of school after that. He could not hold it together. The anger consumed him. He just could not understand how anyone could be so evil to hurt someone in such a violent way. He was very angry. We attended counseling for months. My husband and I were so worried that our son, who had come such a long way since fourth grade, thanks to Tristan, would slide backwards. He has struggled but he has worked to be the light. He knows he cannot let anger win. Tristan would be incredibly mad at him. Cameron no longer has behavioral or academic issues. He is thriving. And I know in my gut and in my heart, Tristan's constant source of love, support, and friendship in the four years that she was his classmate played a critical part in getting, to him, getting him to where he is today. Our family thinks of Tristan daily. We try to do good in her name. We just can't help but think how much better we could do if she was still with us. If only I could thank her for the kindness and the grace that she showed my son every single day. She truly embodied the quote, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. And for that, this mom is incredibly thankful for the amount of work that she did in such a short period of time. We are devastated that she is no longer with us to be the bright light that she brought to Cameron. Anything less than life in prison would be an insult to the goodness that Tristan brought to our world. What he took away from us is a hundred times more devastating than what he could ever add to this world. We will continue to fight the good fight to be the light and to do good deeds in Tristan's name. We will not let hate, evil, or violence win ever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
time for another. Let me let me ask. Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Take your time. <clears throat> Hi, Your Honor. Am I, am I loud enough? I think you're good, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Jennifer Van Dalden. My family has known the Bailey family for over 10 years. Tristan Bailey is like a daughter to me and like a sister to my, my daughter, Madeline. I consider Stacy and Forrest to be two of my closest friends. The pain from losing Tristan in such a violent way is not something you ever get over. It is something heavy that will weigh on my heart every day and I will carry that pain forever. When I close my eyes, I think about the pain she must have suffered that night. And I wish so very much that I could take that from her. I always, I always pray to myself that that in those final moments, she was able to close her eyes and see the faces of family and friends who loved her dearly, rather than the person capable of something so horrific. My new normal since May 9th of 2021 has become living with diagnosed depression, anxiety, migraine and cluster headaches, many panic attacks, difficulty sleeping, and extreme fatigue. This loss has caused so much stress to my entire family. My 11-year-old son, who was nine years old at the time, um, and Tristan spent time together to and from school for many years. They also spent time at family dinners, swimming, and so on. My son always picked on his older sister and her friends. In his third grade year of school, his innocence was stripped from him. On Monday, May 10th, 2021, I asked Oliver to wear white to school in remembrance of Tristan. He went into his room to change and he didn't come back out. I found him crying and so distraught about Tristan being gone. He was so worried that Tristan didn't know that he loved her like a sister. He missed that entire week of school because of course, how was a third grader supposed to cope with this kind of violent loss? committed by a child who also attended his school. My daughter Madeline was in eighth grade at the time. She was very afraid to return to school and missed many days. She failed a depression questionnaire at her routine pediatrician visit. She started having frequent 
debilitating headaches, even into her ninth grade year, that caused her to miss school and many assignments. In May of 2022, a few days after the one year anniversary of Tristan's murder, Madeline had a severe headache in mass in church. She stood up, passed out, and began having seizures. She was taken by ambulance and held for observation. This was most likely stress-induced. My once happy-go-lucky little girl, who was fearless and independent, was now waking up screaming from nightmares, crying every day, not sleeping alone, feeling sick and overwhelmed by daily life, and was just overall sad missing her friend. Not just Tristan's life was taken that day. A piece of everyone close to her was taken as well. I used to think about cute stories I'd share at her wedding one day. We used to joke about it all the time, embarrassing stories I would say. Now we'll never have that day. I hear new songs on the radio and think, she'll never hear this. There will be no more thoughtful birthday texts, no more Starbucks runs, no more hugs, no more air hearts before she went into her house when I was dropping her off. Not a day goes by without tears. Life is forever not as bright as before. I wish every day that I could hug her one more time, but even then, that would not be enough. Aiden Fucci, that day, a piece of me died as well. My happiness will never be the same, and my ability to be carefree is gone. Thank you. Till five this is probably a good stopping point for the day. We'll come back at, um, if I could have the attorneys here by 10 till nine, and then we'll begin, continue with the victim impact statements at 9 a.m., and then you'll be ready to proceed on your case. Thank yes, you, Your Honor. Okay, we're adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow.